from Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode number 101, recorded on January 20th, 2016. I'm Vincent Rackin-Yellow, and, and joining me here in the TWIP studio, Dixon de Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. This is episode 101. It's like the, the basic episode, right? Well, you guys and, should and, you and, start and started Dan, with right, wait, 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 wait. I want to take all of what I just said back. What? Good afternoon, Vincent. And Daniel. Okay. Okay, now we can go for we're, it. We're in the second hundred episodes. Of we Twitter. are. We're in the next millennium. So here's my question. <laughs> are we making 200? Absolutely. Yeah. You're committed? Um, if my genes will let me do that. No, it's yes. not your genes. It's your calendar. No, my genes. It's my genes. <laughs> well, Daniel, now that we're past 100, Daniel and I could do it if you're not around. You think? Because <laughs> you're often traveling. You go to Paris and Bulgaria. I just got back from Paris, actually. And Ethiopia. Just, no, I've never been to Ethiopia. Vietnam. I've never been to Bulgaria. Oregon. I've been to Oregon, yeah. It's okay. like Bulgaria. <laughs> We're in the, the heart of winter here in New York City, aren't we? Are, we are. We are. It's a, it's a very nice sunny day, though. You guys can see out the window. Yesterday was... Totally um, sunny. It was totally unexpected, too. It was like windy, and wind sunny. chill factor was down around 10. Um, <laughs> it's totally sunny. Now, the problem here is that Saturday, we're supposed to get yeah. 42 centimeters of snow. Is that really That's what it's saying here. This is ridiculous. Really? And where will you be Saturday, Vincent? Well, I have a, I'm have. i going to be in t- <laughs> Pittsburgh, but I hope that I can get a flight out. Let's see, when am I leaving on Saturday? Oh, I do hope better. it's early. Uh, uh, I wouldn't want to fly in a snowstorm, thanks. You wouldn't? Nope. I, I don't not have any problem all the with money, that. Not for the tea in China, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's okay. They'll bring the plane in with, remote, down. with the remote control if he gets into trouble. <laughs> I, think I, have a, I think I have an early. I think I have an early flight. Uh, I think uh, I have an early flight on Saturday. Uh, my guess is they're going to cancel it if you got a heavy snowstorm in front of you. Really? Yeah. No. When I take the train back, it's not that far. Uh, how how far is it to Pittsburgh? Could I? My drive? guess is it's uh, three hundred and twenty miles. That's a guess, but I think it's about three twenty. Far. Yeah, Nine right. o'clock Saturday is my flight. I'll be out of there. I'll be out of there. I don't want to get stuck in Pittsburgh. Any Pittsburgh listeners, <laughs> residents, very nice city. <laughs> but I need to get home and edit podcasts. Ah, well, that's true. Like this one, because this will go out on Saturday. Because <laughs> believe me, there's going to be a lot to edit on this one. <laughs> really? You're going to be cursing? No, I don't know. I, I'll try not to breathe into the microphone. How's Let's that? start off with ah, yes. our last case study and ah, all yes. the guesses, Daniel. Oh, this this sounds great. Uh, I believe you've got a you've got our little notes here. Yeah. The, the, Morning the, report at Columbia. Attendings go through interesting cases, uh, and so th- this is actually pretty recent. This is in December that this was presented to me. Right. And uh, we have a 27 year old female, native to New York. She was referred to the outpatient clinic here at the Columbia University Medical Center after seeing her OBGYN, and she had this report of seeing worms in her stool, that's feces, and in her underwear. (laughs) She reports that these were um, an inch or two in length, and as we mentioned, she says they're round. We're going to verify whether or not that's true. (laughs) They are pale white. They're moving. Um, That we do end up verifying. I think we mentioned that. Um, She also reports two to three weeks of abdominal bloating, she says this is constant. Um, she's sexually active. She was um, adventurous with regard to her activities and diet. She works for an NGO and was in a refugee camp in the Ethiopian Sudan border region. This is down in southern Sudan. <clears throat> I think I mentioned that southern Sudan and northern Sudan are quite a bit different. Her um, last visit there was about a month prior to uh, coming back and reporting these symptoms. And she noticed the worms when she got back from the last trip. There were a few little things we threw out. We mentioned that she had eaten a food that was popular there, something called kitfo, which is a raw steak tatar with melted butter. Um, and actually, noticed in the New York Times, they had a whole thing on this. Apparently, that's the, that's <laughs> the hot thing to do is to take your date out to the kitfo um, cafe. and you know, they, they, 
get their cues from TWIP. <laughs> they do. We're, we're a trendsetter. We have, we are. We're definitely a trendsetter. And she did not take malaria prophylaxis, which um, mm. is, That's you know, a pretty dry area down there, though. Come on. it's. But you've been there, right? And she did not avoid the local water. She did. She pointed that she did wear sandals. Uh, <laughs> so she graduated college, nothing remarkable in the family. Right. We got some blood work and everything else, which is pretty remar- pretty right. unremarkable. We mentioned right. that there were no eosinophils and no significant lack of eosinophils. Things looked normal. Her stools were not normal. They were loose, um, but she didn't report mucus or blood. So I, I did have a question last time that I saved for today, and that is, has she suffered weight loss recently? Oh, that's a great. That's a great question. I think that's one of those questions that someone might think of if they were um, considering this. And maybe they would think of it, in a, even though they shouldn't be thinking of it. Maybe right. we'll get into that later. I hope we do. <laughs> she did not report any um, significant change in weight. She's a right. pretty thin lady. Right. All right. We have guesses. <laughs> Boy, do we. <laughs> Wink writes. My old copy of Basic Clinical Parasitology says that Enterobius vermicularis can be up to 13 millimeters long. I think a scared patient could round that up to an inch. <laughs> common things being common, I'm guessing pinworms in the 23-year-old female traveler. However, I'm probably wrong <laughs> because Daniel wouldn't throw that same pitch twice. We don't know that, though. Wink, Wink. Wink is confident that's a good answer. Wink is a doc. It's a good answer. Uh Daniel, can you take Alan's, please? Alan writes, Dear Doctors Twip, greetings from the big island of Hawaii, where it was a chilly 20C when I got up this morning. Mm-hmm. It was warm to a nice 27C <laughs> by noon. We have our own small outbreak here. In mid-October, I was called in by a local clinic to diagnose a patient with fever and a strange rash that I'm told has become our first confirmed autochronous or locally acquired case of dengue on our island in 70 years. I asked them to test for dengue and chikungunya since everyone knows we don't have dengue here. (laughs) Now we're up to some 215 confirmed cases of dengue, Hmm. although our state public health, county civil defense, and health department have done a great job jumping on it quickly. A big promotion to fight the bite and reduce mosquito bites. (laughs) Three limited... Permethrin aqua resin sprayings for adult mosquitoes within 200 yards around a confirmed case over the 10 days or so it takes mosquitoes themselves to become infectious. Since our two local Aedes species that carry dengue don't generally fly more than 150 yards and biological control pellets, mosquito bites, that contain dehydrated mosquito, mosquitocidal bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, which can be put in tires and other mosquito habitat difficult to otherwise eliminate. The last report is they are monitoring only one confirmed case who could still be infectious, but it's the asymptomatic but infectious cases you still worry about. Uh, Thank you for that. That's actually, you know, I, I was with a colleague from Japan and he was telling us of a case and you know, everyone was listening to this saying, it sounds like dengue, it sounds like dengue. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, the first, of course, case seen in Japan. So um, that, that's how you diagnose the first case. You diagnose the first case when nobody knows it's there right. and then you realize it's there and then you start getting all these others. So Exactly. There's more to that letter. More. There is, and I will continue. And by the way, the Big Island is a great, great... Hopefully you're over on the west side where it's nice and sunny as opposed to the east side where it rains. But um, what a great CRISPR-Cas article discussion and interesting case. I have twice spent three months working in Uganda just south of southern Sudan where your patient had worked. Uh And like your patient, I am a strong advocate of adventurous eating and love (laughs) Ethiopian food. Nitter Kibe, their spiced clarified butter, is one of Ethiopia's wonderful secrets. And I have no problem loving meat in their stir fries, tibs, or stews, watts. But I would want the raw beef in Kitfo and Kurt to be from a very trusted food supplier and cook. <clears throat> An Ethiopian friend in Baltimore, perhaps, but maybe not in rural <laughs> Ethiopia. Right. <laughs> as a different, as a diagnostic differential, I actually like this. We're going to get the whole. Uh, You're going to get, get an overview on this one. That's right. I went down the list of human helmets. <laughs> okay, one pinworm. All you need to see a pinworm infection, and Aerobius vermicularis, is a bit of sticky, clear tape. But, <clears throat> one, I doubt they would be described without also mentioning intense itching. And two, adult pinworms would be much smaller, perhaps an eighth of an inch versus the one-inch worm described. Here, here. 
roundworms. I have seen many live active Ascaris lumbricoides, but usually only subsequent to having given older deworming medication, and they are much larger, two to five inches. Mm. Whipworms, Trichurus trichura, about the right size, but you never see the actual worms unless there's a rectal prolapse in young kids. Hookworms, a female hookworm would be that size, but I have only seen hookworms in kids with a prolapsed rectum, which was not described in this case. You don't see much threadworm or strongyloides in Africa, much more in Asia. Flukes are round and often the size described. <clears throat> if the kitvo contained ground beef liver or lungs, could a beef lung fluke or liver fluke have been ingested? Sure. Would it be still active after passing through the human intestinal tract? I don't think so, and especially would not be emerging a month later. However, in Uganda, I recall seeing active white worms about the size mentioned emerging from the stool of cattle. I was told they were Monizia expansa, a tapeworm whose primary hosts are sheep, goats, cattle, and perhaps pigs, but were more likely Monizia benedeni, which are more common in cattle. While officially a flatworm at this stage, they appear fairly round. While there are reported cases of human infection with Monesia, ostensibly from food contamination, it is rare. But that rabbit trail of thought brings me right around to Tenia sargent, or beef tapeworm, which can cause an ongoing human infection. The cysts in the beef muscle could have easily found their way into minced Ethiopian kitfu or curt, which is then ingested, and over the next couple months, the cysts become happy adult tapeworms in the human intestine. <laughs> in an otherwise well-nourished person, the only symptom would be that of feeling bloated or having mild gastric symptoms until the egg-carrying segments actively crawl out, which is usually accompanied by itching, which was not described, but they would be about the right length and color. Still, this fits the picture best, so my guess is Tiania, Sergeant, with the outside possibility of Monasia. In the U.S., a single one-gram dose of niclosamide would usually prove effective, although in Ethiopia, they are more likely to use prosequantal. Fortunately, it would be easily treated with little chance of other complications. Mm. I would be delighted to be proven wrong as I've learned <laughs> so much from your podcast. What a great hundredth podcast and start of another year of TWIP. Keep up the great listening. You're an inspiration and make my commute now downright enjoyable. After listening to your podcast with my girls this morning on the way to school, my 12-year-old announced Sunday at dinner that she wants to do our upcoming science fair poster on possible CRISPR-Cas <laughs> applications on dengue mosquitoes. Wonderful. That is, that's fantastic. Did you, you know, I noticed you were rocking your head back and forth there. Did you want to jump in and make some comments or should yeah, we well, wait? Let's wait. I think we should wait, but I, I, I have a pronouncer's gazetteer for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go it, back. Was, it was my pronunciation. No, was... Well, they were close. They were close. How's that? So I guess I'm next to read. You read away. So Venkat writes, hello, Twippies. I think the girl returned from Sudan could have acquired Ascaris lumbricoides while she was serving refugees in Sudan. It is very common in such areas of poor sanitation. I don't think it could have been anything to do with her swimming in the waters or eating local food. Thanks uh, to your inspiring pod series, my friend, a public health postgraduate, and I, a trainee in clinical infectious diseases, are planning to start our own podcast in my native language. Tamil, which is spoken in southern India. Although we are not experts in the field like you people, we figured this would be a great learning experience for us as well as our audience. <laughs> if we could find some, if we could find some. <laughs> Dr. Vincent, I read your articles in ASM journals about the benefits of podcasting. I was wondering how managed to set the whole thing up at the beginning. Uh, that, I read that verbatim, but I meant to say, I wonder how to manage setting the whole thing up at the beginning. Did you pay someone to do it or by yourselves? I would be glad if you could provide some tips regarding this. Again, thanks to you all for being such an inspiration. Congratulations to Twip for the 100th episode. I wish a long life to Twip, Twim, and Twiv. Hmm. That was a nice letter. I didn't pay anybody. <laughs> I learned it myself because I'm a scientist and I could learn how to do anything, basically. And uh, if you... I think I've talked about what I did uh, before. I don't know what kind of detail you want, but I would suggest you go to the podcasterstudio.com. Our friend Ray Ortega from ASM, he, he edits TWIM for us. He is a 
person who teaches people how to podcast. There are actually tons of people out there now who do this. Successful systems attract parasites. <laughs> Podcasting is getting big, so suddenly there are lots of people who want to teach you how to podcast or host your podcast That's or do right. something to make That's money right. off of your podcast. And all of that was not the case when we started. I just did it myself, and I continue to do so. The Podcasterstudio.com. I don't know if there's the. Let's check it out. Podcast, yeah, Podcasterstudio.com. There's two S's in there. And he has tips on how to get a podcast started, and you can even email him or hit him up on Twitter, and he'll answer your question. So, Vincent, what is the most important thing we learned from our first podcast? Turn on the recorder. Damn right. <laughs> That's exactly what we learned <laughs> because we did like an hour's worth and then we realized yeah. that the recorder was on. Mistakes. We had to go back. Then you know what? That's everybody's. From that, from that has come my whole. It's fantastic. I have a, what do you call it? A protocol to you do a, everything. You have a pattern. It's a pattern. No, I think as a scientist, you'd call it a protocol. protocol. I, I noticed that in science. You ask someone, oh, how do I do such and such? They won't tell you. They will email you a protocol. <laughs> email you a protocol. <laughs> or a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It's like the recipe for podcasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's so right. First, turn on the recorder. It's I, formulaic. It's <laughs> formulaic. What, I did, what I did has evolved over the years, and I've streamlined it, and I've invested some money. Yeah. So call Ray. He'll help you out. No, you have a nice ensemble. Turn on the equipment. recorder. Yeah, technically now, this is all smooth. And when it sounds I, great. And it sounds wonderful. When I go on the road, you should see, I have all the stuff packed. Yeah, yeah. I set it up. I record. I break it down. All myself, I have a protocol because otherwise you forget something. Correct. Just like an airplane pilot and a co You got to have everything. You got to bring they everything with you. You have a checklist. Flaps, check. Maybe that's it, a checklist. Dick, check. Oop, check. Okay. Turn on the sound recorder. Check. Mike writes, I'm going for <laughs> trichuriasis. Trichuris trichiura. Commonly known well as human whipworm because you... <laughs> Had taught me years ago how to pronounce it because I kept mispronouncing it. Because <laughs> we did an episode on tricky. We did. We did that. Yes, we I've did. I've got to break my losing streak, Mike from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, we've got some bad. No, that's yeah. not right. <laughs> well, well, we'll tell him. We'll give him the bad news later. Anne writes, <laughs> right. I am venturing a diagnosis of Tania saginata infection. The description of the wriggling parasite sounds very much like that of cats with the flea tapeworm. Diphylidrium canum, although larger. <laughs> Dixon didn't like that. Yeah, he didn't like that. Do you want to correct that quickly? Dipylidium. Thank you. Caninum. Wow. Crawling lice rice grains is the usual description from pet owners. Yep. I consulted. Oh, this looks like a good book. Dixon's Parasitic Diseases. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> but it's a third edition. That's an old one. You couldn't find the size of the proglottid. But was unable to determine proglottid size. <laughs> mm. The description of the proglottids crawling down the patient's thigh, producing a tickling <laughs> sensation, was somewhat unnerving. Yeah, we have a case. Of I think it's in the appendix, right? Isn't it in the appendix, the sizes of that? But anyway. It is. And from Beaverton, Oregon. Oregon. Another Oregon. Yeah, yeah. Hey, guys, are you guys re, uh, revising this book? We are. Uh, well, the, he's done all the work so far, it's but gonna I, be I the promise to catch up. sixth edition, right? That's correct. That's I have actually correct. rewritten about a quarter of it. I'm just Who's going to publish it? That's another good question. Apple trees. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We're gonna, we're gonna shop it around. You gonna find a publisher? We will. Well, we have this. We have this goal. I don't know if I've, we've shared it with you, but our goal is we feel that there's a lack of parasitology education um, in this twip? country twip? throughout What's the world. Twip? Yeah, but not everybody listens to it. They should. Well, of course they should, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so our goal is to get this textbook in the hands of every medical student in the United exactly, States right. exactly, and also to right. try to distribute it throughout the world, try to create some yeah. way where there isn't a financial obstacle to this occurring. Right. And so we're, we're trying to do this as a, a humanitarian effort. Well, if you That's get a right. publisher, that'll be hard because it'll charge a lot of money. Yeah, we do know that. <laughs> That's a drawback. That is a big drawback, actually. You're right. But so, if you self-publish it, it could be printed on if demand. If we had a grant, That's, be that may be what, that may be if how we If we had a grant it. from an NGO whose goal in life yeah. was to empower Makes people, Makes sense. they could open source, so do then, then we can just use that money to distribute the book. I think or we could, we could crowd rise it or we something. We could crowd source. Crowd source. Crowd source. Thing, crowd source. Yeah. But yeah, that's our goal. Our goal is to get it back out there, have it relevant, and try to get it out there to the people that need it. Exactly. Next. Robin. Robin, Robin writes, <clears throat> one-inch adult enteric nematodes are esophagostomum, Terendes diminutus and strongyloides, none of which present as adults in a relatively benign fashion in human stool. 
Well, there may be, well, yet another wild enteric nematode that presents benignly as one-inch adults in human stool. A large load of immature askers could also conceivably do so. If possible, wild ones are excluded. It would also be consistent with the report of up to two inches. NAACP is, or maybe was, the standard mnemonic for causes of eosinophilia. Neoplasm, uh, Addison's, no, that's not, that should be Addison's, correct? Addison's allergy. <clears throat> allergy, connective tissue disease, and parasites. Ah. Then he said, five centimeter nematodes passed in stool while, tr- while trichuris is not usually passed spontaneously in the stool. Treatment with non-prescription antihelmetics might cause this. Did you know that was a mnemonic in AACP? So I, I have to, I Robin, no Robin, you may be older than I am. The mnemonic I learned <laughs> was uh, China. China. So C standing for connective tissue diseases, ah. H for helminths, you know, so and so. So N N double A C P may, uh, you know, that may be, maybe it's an older mnemonic. Could be. All right. Our last one is from Tejas. Who, and there's some people missing here, at least in lower Manhattan. Where are you? Where's Zach? Where's your guest? <laughs> exactly. Miss you. Look, I know everyone's busy, but <laughs> you have to take time for TWIP. <laughs> right. Tejas writes, Hello, doctors. Namaste and congratulations on episode 100 of TWIP. I am a microbiology undergrad and have been an audience to this great podcast for about a year now. But this would be the first time writing for me. The weather here in Mumbai is weird and fluctuating a lot. And as a result, I am down with the common cold. Oh, dear. Oh, blame it on the weather, will you? (laughs) It's a virus. (laughs) I've barely scratched the surface of the micro world. And it has grabbed my interest like nothing else before. And TWIP is helping with that. This trio really entertains as well as enlightens me every time I tune into TWIP. And... As all, always thank you, Dr. Griffin, for another great case. And my guess for this one would be Tania saginata, as its infection is pretty common in Africa. And with the ingestion of kitfo, which is essentially raw beef, this would explain a lot. And the infection is essentially asymptomatic unless it is just way too much, in which case it presents with some severe symptoms. The diagnosis is via examination of the stool. In addition to this, the body of the worm is also white in color. It might be worthwhile to point out that this is a tapeworm, though. I'm not sure of this diagnosis, but it is definitely worth to try. Keep twipping away. I hope you continue the podcast for as long as you can. That's a great wish. Yeah, we will, right? You bet. Okay, now for the reveal. All right. (laughs) Show me a picture. Well, I, I'm not sure if I should show him the picture right away. No, right away. Uh, then. But you well, know what this is. What is your but, guess? <clears throat> well, until I figured out that this woman wasn't entirely upfront with regards to the description, I had no guess. Where because did you find that out? There's no such thing as the kind of worm she described. <laughs> so it had to be something either misdescribed or spurious. So I had no definitive diagnosis. Basically. Let me. I'm going to lead you a little farther, and then we're going to we're going to expect him to just tell us what it is right from there. <laughs> so that that was the that was the big thing that that caught me was the is this round or right. is it flat? Right. And uh, you know she said it was round, and then then the next the next thing was that the patient comes to clinic with a stool sample with something in there. She's uh-huh. actually got she's collected this and brought it in. And my first question is. What is my first question? Is it round or is it flat? <laughs> right. Animal, vegetable, and even when I even when I saw like a picture and, and a yeah, video of yeah, it, yeah, I yeah, turned yeah, to the yeah. person who saw it. I said, "You saw this. Was it round or was it flat?" And the the answer was, "It was flat." Okay, then that seals the deal. <clears throat> so that so that helps, and I'm not going to let you guess yet. Okay. So uh, <laughs> so because there's two things here now. So first we have that it actually is flat and not round. So that's important. Um, and the second thing, and I think this is really critical for our people when they're trying to think it out, is that, is this the entire worm or is this just a piece of the worm? So when I was going through this with the house offices, I brought up the issue that um, if you're thinking about certain worms, some of them are segmented and some of them are non-segmented. And, you know, from the initial description, when they, they give this, she says she found this round worm, it's a couple inches in length. You know, people were actually and thinking were a bunch of them, and they, they, yeah, you know, she's seeing a bunch of them. What do you think people were thinking? What was the? A lot of people were were worried about ascaris. Now, mm-hmm. it's a little small for ascaris, yeah. right? I mean, they, usually the adults tend to be about twice that size, right? And they and they really are round, yeah. 
So that that's sort of you know you, you were the size thinking of this pen. I'm holding up a pen in my hand. They're this big. <laughs> <laughs> so I like. I mean, we can go back actually to one of the uh, one of the people that emailed us. Um, who sent us this email? Dear Doctors Twip, with all the different worms in here. Oh, yeah, that was Alan. That was uh, right. Alan from the Big Island. Yeah, let's talk about Alan's letter because it was a definitive. Um, hey, we asked for a differential. Differential last time boy, he, did he give it he to delivers. us? Delivers. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. So now Great. that we now that we know it's flat, I think we can work through this differential a little bit better. So the Correct. the first pinworms. They're they're not flat. No, they're real. Um, and they're very thread like. They're actually a lot harder to see. And and even though maybe they can be a centimeter or a little bit more, that that's actually rather uncommon. I no. I think of them as being a couple millimeters, maybe three millimeters or so. Exactly. Um, and also, but they do migrate out into the underwear and stuff like that. So yeah. there is that possible. That was the um, the misleading fact was that this was a worm that actually crawled out of the patient. So that not too many do that. But some do, and then he mentions Ascaris, which I think we just we just addressed. Right. Um, next uh, comes the the whipworm. Yep. Um, and again, it's it's not a it's not a situation where we often see the worm. These worms don't like to come out into the world. That's, um, true. that's not really part of their life cycle. That is right. Um, I wouldn't see those. Now the flukes. The, the no, wait flukes. a minute. I, I don't need oh, to just stop at to... the hookworm. If it was a female hookworm, those are not white. Worms, they're red. Mm -hmm. Why are they red? Because they're filled with your blood, that's why. <laughs> so they wouldn't be just white worms. But they're, they're, I, I have a jar of, of adult hookworm, and they're, they're just a little bit bigger than pinworms. In your office not, here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I have some crazy things. Yeah, you do. You have there. jars. I have jars we, of We worms. put pictures of them in the old episodes. We did. That was ages ago. Yeah, it was, wasn't it, though? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and I so, guess I guess I also see thrown in there is the threadworm or strongyloides. That's right. And and what do you think? Do you think you're going to see those with the naked eye and mm, intratude? Yeah. No, these are <laughs> no these, way. These are no way. Microscope says no way. Okay. No way. No. <laughs> these are very tiny. Unheard of. Okay. So, then we then we get into so we you want to jump in there? Go, ahead, no, we go no, to no, flukes. No, we get no, into no, flukes. 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 And what about what about flukes? And what about them? You know, flukes. I, I always think of a fluke in my mind as as like a leaf. You know, a tree metode. Um, you know, would they would they be described this way? Schistosomes are trematodes, and they're round. They're absolutely round, so that doesn't really quite fit the mold. I guess they're round like you curl your tongue round. But they right? live well. The, the male is. <laughs> the male is kind of that yeah, that's nice. Right. The female is nice and yeah, round. Yeah, female is pretty so, round. So the point is that they would they live in the blood supply, so they would never gain access to the lumen of the gut and then pass out. So they could never be the cause of this. Okay. But then, you know what else I would have asked this woman? I said, describe how they moved. Mm -hmm. Show me with your finger. If that's the worm, show me how it moved. So, the well, Vincent is doing an inchworm imitation right now. So that's one kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Another one is what we would call serpiginous. serpiginous. Right, like a snake, right? So if it's a nematode, a roundworm, nematodes are fond of serpiginous motion. Like Cenorhabditis elegans, okay. Everybody's probably familiar with that. That's had you know genetics because it's now one of the big organisms used in genetics. But if it's a flatworm, these are unusual worms because they almost look like a caterpillar in the sense that they they scunch up and then the front end goes out and then they scunch up again and the front end goes. I've watched these things and I've watched live tapeworm segments move, and there, there's absolutely no mistaking it for a nematode. So, you know, if we had carried that conversation a little bit further and asked her to say, "Show me with your finger how the worms moved," yeah, and then she would say, "I'll show you with my finger." No, 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 <laughs> Vincent. This is a remember family show. Caleb is listening. It's a family <laughs> show. Yeah, but it's not video, family so it doesn't show. matter. It's a family show. <laughs> Yes, no one could see that obscene. No, but everybody has a vivid imagination that <laughs> listens to us. They have to. So so those those two clues, and then there are so many of them, you know, and then there and then there were pure white. That's the other thing. Pure white. Now white. is there is there a name for that caterpillar like Asterisk. movement where we have serpentine? Is there is there a name um, for the cater caterpillar it's... crawling movement? Well it's we could we could name it right. We could it's, we could it's, invent it. It's, it's almost peristaltic. <laughs> it's almost the mo the motion is almost peristaltic. You know the front end moves a little bit and scunches up and, and then it propels itself along the surface of a let's say 
the grass. You know, when the when the when the worms are past, the the segments all disconnect, and they can crawl quite a bit away from the original deposit of feces. And uh, that's how the cattle sometimes get uh, infected with it because they wouldn't dare eat the feces. There's a repulsion of uh, a zone of repulsion where the feces is actually deposited. The worms can be quite a bit away from the circle of uh, repulsion, and uh, therefore, if the <laughs> if the cattle are careful and eat around it, they can still acquire the infection. If only all animals experienced that zone of repulsion, <laughs> the copra, We'd be a lot, coprophagic uh, dogs that seem oh, they well, seem to. Uh, <laughs> this is true. The dogs are an exception to this rule. This is very true. So, so I will I will actually say I was able to see this thing move, and this had a caterpillar like movement. But okay. even more so, it did this. Uh, you know, as, uh, even though I've seen parasites, it, it almost as if it were raising its head before it did that. And it was a little bit disturbing, this sort yes, of seeking, <laughs> this sort of seeking. It's called questing. This questing. questing so there's behavior. a video that I would highly recommend to show you what this might look like in movement. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Spanish Dancer. Do you know what organism that is? No. Nope. Well, we have a big laboratory that's not too far away from this laboratory. And the Eric Candel's group works on Eplesia. Which is a sea slug. Hexabranchus sanguineus. There you go. It's the six blood-colored six gills nudie branch. So if you watch this sea thing slug. swim, mm. you know, you can see it sort of undulating. It almost yeah. doesn't go any place, but it undulates. You no, know, I, I typed in Spanish dancer, and that's the first hit. You would think an actual Spanish dancer <laughs> yeah, you would come would, up, but, <laughs> but it's actually a nudie branch. That's right. That's right. <laughs> wow. Nudie brank. Nudie brank. brank. Nudie brank. Sorry. That's right. We're because all the gills are on the outside. It's got naked gills, basically. Yeah. That's what it means. Wow. And they're beautiful animals. There's a whole bunch of them. They're called uh, sea hares. There's a whole series of names for these things. And there's huh. a website that you can go to on the images and find some high-resolution pictures of these because they're aquarium pets for people with saltwater aquaria. These are fabulous-looking organisms. They're, I have a collection. Maybe I'll put it up as my pick of the week some week. It's just fabulous shapes. It's like collecting the pictures of praying so, mantises. having heard this, yeah. what now is your... Well, American? it's, you know, the raw meat eating and living like the natives and uh, wanting mm -hmm. to be part of their culture. You can't refuse their food. Beef so, tapeworm? Of course. Tenius Tenius sarginata. sarginata. Sergeant. Someone said sergeant. I don't, I don't... That's... I think it's a minor synonym for Tenius sarginata. So this is the beef tapeworm. It doesn't mean that the beef animal has the tapeworm adult, because mm -hmm. humans have the adult. They have the larval stage. The, the, uh, and their muscles. Yes. Which and then you have to eat. eat it raw in order to acquire this, and that's exactly what you did. And then they go to your intestine, they, they hatch. They do. They do. And then they come out. And they just grab right on. So tenia saginata actually just has sucker discs. And they stay there for a long time? Forever. <laughs> and do they mate and... The yeah, they, segments, if one worm is producing all the segments and you don't have two worms, the segments can fold back on each other and exchange yeah. um, sperm. So what actually so, coming out? The segments? Yeah, the mature, gravid segments with can, all the eggs. And they can crawl? And they can crawl. So they can sometimes crawl out in your bed sheets at night. And you wake up in the morning and there's... Well, one of, those stu one of the students described to me, they had spent some time in Africa. They had acquired an adult tapeworm, and they hadn't known it. And they were standing on the A-train platform over here on 168th Street waiting to go downtown. And <laughs> this guy looks down, and he sees this little white thing creeping across the platform of the Kidding. subway stop, and it was a segment from his own there? tapeworm. How did it came out of his And he didn't realize it came in from him first. Oh, but he, says, he probably was wearing shorts, right? No, 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 no. no. It was a... <laughs> it was a not Weird. a hilarious situation for him, but he later on found another one, brought it into the lab, and they diagnosed it as teenage. So would that be a proglotted? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Or a segment. It's segment, it either way yeah. is, is, is correct. Tenia saginata. You can That's find right. that on TWIP. You can. And which episode was that? Like, it's like number 12 or something like that? It was yeah, early on. A TWIP number, number six. <laughs> number six. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that goes way back. That's a long time ago. That goes wow. way back. Tapeworms, the long and short of it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we had it all there in number six. Right. In fact, the first... 20 episodes of TWIP are a nice textbook for learning about parasites if you don't want to read it. That's right. But the accompanying book 
you know, Dixon's parasitology. <laughs> that would be great. Well, Dixon and Dan's, or Dan's and Dixon. I'm so, not sure uh, how we've worked Daniel, that out what, <laughs> did, what <laughs> clinched the diagnosis? The photograph? Well, well, let's let's continue. How'd so get one so of these? He, he he jumped right on the. Uh, so so how do we know that tape? How do we know that tapeworm? How do we know it couldn't have been some other tapeworm? Was there? Is do we already know this thing is long? And narrow as opposed to boxy or as opposed to wide and short? Do we, right. do we sort so of already a, know? It's a taneid if it's long and narrow. And it's a uh, diphilobothrium or a, a pseudophilidian if it's wider than it is long. Mm. So this was longer than it was wide. And uh, that would fall into the category. Yeah, so there were two, thing, two things we got. Well, one is we've got that thing right in front of us so we can look at so you it. Had, you had a specimen. So we actually have the specimen. Which you collected have the, from her, right? For, and we look at the specimen. It's a single segment. Mm -hmm. It's not an entire worm. It's a proglotted. And when you actually take this and you stain it, you see sort of a dark uh, area in the, cent in the center. And then all these branches, I will say more than 12 branches coming out <laughs> laterally. And so and now, now we, we already have the diagnosis. What did you stain um, it with? Um, so actually, they, they I think it was an H&E. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of one that I took myself, which is yeah. actually a silver stain, I think it is. Um, actually, I can tell what, you exactly what, sta what, what that stain is. is that? It's not a stain. <laughs> no, it's okay. not a stain. It's, uh, believe it or not, they took a tuberculin syringe and filled it with India ink. And because the proglottid was then um, dead, fixed, it's not alive in, in anymore, you can actually ref reflex this over your index finger and thumb so that the segment sort of droops over the first part, almost like a Salvador Dali painting. Mm -hmm. And with this <laughs> tuberculin syringe filled with India ink, you can actually puncture the segment and get right into the uterine branches the and then inject it. Yeah. And so you've just injected the branches yeah. with uh, India ink. So it's not even stained. You can do this like 20 minutes after you get the specimen. So you put the specimen between two glass slides. You submerge the glass slides in uh, formalin, 10% formalin. You leave it there for 20 minutes. You take it out. You take the segment. You put it over your finger. You take the syringe. I've done this many, many, many times also. And you can just fill up and you're right. But it's 12 branches on only one side. So you don't count both sides when you count the mm. branches. If there's more than 12 branches to the uterus, it's got to be tinea saginata. Cool. If it's less than 12, mm -hmm. significantly, let's say it's 10 or less, the odds are in favor of it being tinea solium, the pig tapeworm, yeah. the pork tapeworm. So this is a commonly done diagnostic procedure to inject it with India ink. Yeah, that's yeah. Or you can, in our case, See, we just this is section. why Dixon is valuable. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We don't. It's the it. only reason things this <laughs> yeah, no, well, These are old world technologies applied to it, but, but now there are PCR tests for these of two course. parasites because they can get the eggs, and the eggs look exactly the same. There's no difference. There's no way to tell them apart. All teeny eggs look the same, so that you've got to use another kind of test. Hmm. And in this case, it's a PCR. Yeah, and in, actually, in this case, the woman did have a lot of eggs. So I have a picture, but um, you know, it's a nice, smooth. Um, outside surface of the egg, it's not yep. mammillated or yep. ruffled, and there's sort of a thing. Almost, it looks like a sun. It looks like a you know. There's the radiation, there and then the central part is is a little bit lighter. It's called a hexacanth um, larva inside. It's got six little hooklets, yep. and when this thing hatches in your gut tract, that's what it gloms on to the the uh, on the intestinal tract of a cow. And then it penetrates through the intestinal tract into the bloodstream and then gets distributed throughout the body. So if you, can you get this in the U.S.? Oh, yeah. If you don't cook your meat? You can. It's very, very, very unusual. But if you go to Mexico, it's not unusual at all. See, what do you have to have in order for this life cycle to complete itself? You have to have an adult tapeworm in a human, and then what? And then you have to have fecal contamination yeah, of right. cattle. Okay. So. We don't most, have much of that here, yeah. Most cattle ranchers don't, but remember the case, the big and the short of it. This, this, The woman brought her tapeworm to Brooklyn. Yeah, right. And where was she from? She was from northern Mexico, mm -hmm. where they have a lot of this tapeworm. Mm -hmm. So um, their sanitary conditions are not uh, ideal. All right, fecal contamination. Human fecal contamination yeah. of cattle food. So no. like in the hay or something. Mm-hmm. 
Now I'm going to give people a little bit of a mnemonic. Like, how are you going to remember all this stuff we we throw at you, right? You know, Teach I it for 38 I, yeah. years you won't see. Forget. You could do it that way. So that's one option. <laughs> all our listeners would like to teach this for 30 years. They could do that. The other is I'm over in India, and so I'm talking with a bunch of infectious disease. Doctors. How do you how do you keep these straight? The the three that people are trying to keep straight in all honesty are the beef tapeworm, right? The Tetia saginata, um, the pork tapeworm, the Tetia solium. Tinea, am I pronouncing that wrong? No, no, you're <laughs> Tinea. You're almost right on. <laughs> Tinea. And then, and then you've got the fish tapeworm. Want to jump uh, in on that one? Uh, Diphilobothrium latum. Okay, right. Yeah. So, so the story actually is. I don't know if you know this, but the tapeworms were actually created by the gods in India, right? And there are three main gods, but then there's just uh, millions uh, of other uh, gods, uh, and, and they were competing who gets to make which tapeworm. And if you're in India. Which tapeworm is the most important in Indian society? Of course, it's the beef tapeworm, it has right? I mean, the, the cows are sacred. They're walking. So the but best, they don't eat them. So the best artist gets to create. The best god artist gets to create the ba- beef tapeworm. I have a question. Yes. In, if you're in India, the, the cows are not eaten, though. Is that correct? Oh, that's, that's true. They wander so the streets. How they're, they're revered. Would you ever get a beef tapeworm, then? Oh, you'd, you'd, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the gods are allowed to eat the beef. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it would be very difficult. I wonder if the gods are. I don't know if they are. You get it from <laughs> contaminated water. Mm. You have to eat raw or yeah, undercooked beef. Yeah, you need yeah. the cyst. Pork. So how would you? And pork is out of question. <laughs> so, so that is a, a telltale for someone who's eating beef when they shouldn't. I would have questioned yeah. that mythology. <laughs> yes, if, she, they, was, if she was a uh, Hindu and revered the cattle, and she came in with this, I'd say we need to have a little talk. We so, have to have a little talk, but so don't tell your neighbors. Is, is there tinea saginata in India? So there are certain segments of the population. No in, pun intended. In India that, well, let, let me let, let me finish the God story first, then we'll get to that question. Okay, so the one the the God who is the most favored and has the great creates the beef woman and he makes it it's long and it's beautiful and it has multiple uterine branches it's beautiful now the next the next guy is the one who gets to make the pig worm it's okay job you know and there's <laughs> pigs there and stuff but most of india is is away from the water so the one who gets the fish is like the fish one no one no one sees fish in most of india so he he basically makes this short little one. So that's how you can tell them apart. The beef one is long and, and has all these branches yeah. out. The pig one's sort of in that's between. Funny. And then, okay. But no, the so there, there are... The <laughs> longer than the other two, by the way. The, the, we're talking about the segments, the little, oh, you know, nice. the little segment, the proglot. This is the proglots. Right. But um, no, so there are certain segments of the population in India that do eat beef, right? You know, people who are there not are. the yeah, Muslim, for instance. This is true. This okay. is true. Um, I actually ate beef. In, I wasn't going to eat beef in India, yeah. but then I was walking down the street and I got too close to a cow and he just, <laughs> with the horns right in the oh. belly, Ooh, so hard. Really, really? Yeah. So when I got to a oh, big dear. city that I ate some, I ate some beef just to, just to get even. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the British introduced a lot of eating habits in India that they didn't have before the British got there. So uh, drinking gin and tonics to get rid of malaria was another one of their additions, I think. You know, so this, so this woman um, had, uh, you know, had the beef tapeworm. Um, there were the eggs. There was that proglotted segment. Um, and she actually was, was treated with praziquantel. Right. Um, but here's the other thing, which I wanted to throw in. I think I mentioned that she had all this abdominal bloating. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, is that common with uh, beef tapeworm to get all this abdominal bloating? Um, in all of my years of teaching and listening to physicians who have treated these parasites, the answer is no. Yeah, and, and I'm, glad, I'm glad you say that because a lot of people would say, oh, and I guess you got, I heard a case and it was abdominal bloating. Um, what we have now is these wonderful biofilm array where they do these multiplex um, studies on the stool. She had a second infection. Yeah, I was going to say that. Huh. And, it was, yeah. and it was, uh, huh. I guess it's a parasite. It's Giardia. She yeah, had Giardia. She had Giardia too. As wow. well. Well, so she was <laughs> living close to the ground, as wow. it were. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was also treated with what? Uh, metronidazole. And after oh, all this. Um, so both at the same time? Um, yes. Yeah, sure. One so dose. She had two. One dose. Or no, she I, she did a week of the metronidazole, okay. and then she was fine. Mm-hmm. Right. Praziquantel first, and then. That's yeah. So her bloating went away, and the worm stopped crawling out, and that was. And it. she started heading back to Africa and eating more kid food. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. Tell, did you tell her not to eat raw beef? Oh, I didn't tell her anything. Remember, I'm just the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope they told so, her not to eat raw beef. Well, so, but you know, but you know, what's the problem with eating raw beef? I mean, I understand it's it's you know. Tinea saginata. Yeah, but you know, 
Just some okay, other things we'll it. talk about. No. <laughs> <clears throat> I asked you whether or not <laughs> we could go on about raw beef for yes. a long time. So I asked you whether she had lost any weight. And so that would have been consistent with a Giardia case. That would have. And yeah. whether she had flatulence mm-hmm. that were, you know, socially unacceptable yeah. and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So that never actually emerged from that briefcase history and because it, it was about yeah. the tapeworm. Yeah, and it is a challenge with Giardia. In a lot of areas in the world, there are people who have Giardia detectable in the GI yeah. tract, and it's not really clear it's giving well, that, them any symptoms, there, any, any, you know, any obvious no gastrointestinal symptoms. There's a lot of controversy. Maybe it creates other cognitive and well, growth um, inhibition. Maybe. But We've got an expert here. His name is Richard Deckelbaum, and he does work on this all over the world, and he has identified carrier states for Giardia where they're asymptomatic, and apparently if you catch this as a kid and you're an asymptomatic carrier, your growth rate is better. Which is totally unexplainable by most common logical. I think I think they do better on these cognitive tests, which also is you <laughs> I've know. Seen many of them yeah. with Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. So in this in this part of uh, Sudan, it was. So it's a southern, southern Sudan, Sudan Ethiopian. Border. Is this is this endemic? For beef, yes. Uh, tapeworm yes. infection. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what? Does it is it lethal? Can it kill you? No. Well, so that's what I was trying to bring yeah. up. So we brought up the do you lose weight with a tapeworm infection? And people yeah. always talk about that, like, oh my gosh, that guy keeps eating so much, he must have a must tapeworm. Have a tapeworm. That's right. um, and, and there's a little bit of a, a mythology there. Yeah, there is. is you tend not to lose. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. tapeworms can only eat so much. <laughs> no, they don't want to eat much because they don't need much. Their metabolism is pretty. Um, it's a micro aerophilic organism. It's not an anaerobe. It's a micro aerophil. Do you typically have just one or a few? Typically or? one. It's typically it. one. So the first one that attaches, we thought for a long time, listening to the tapeworm biologists at these meetings that I used to go mm-hmm. to, they were convinced that the first worm, as it matures, secretes something which excludes the other incomers. Because your diet doesn't change just because you have an adult right. tapeworm. You continue to eat beef. and Where does this attach? In the small intestine? Small. Small intestine. Is it relatively high up in the small intestine? It's very high up. In fact, it's in the duodenum. And as Ah. the meal passes through the duodenum and moves down further, this worm detaches and moves with the meal until it actually gets to a a zone of uncomfortableness. (laughs) No, I'm not kidding. Because by that time, the food is mostly absorbed Mm -hmm. because it's digested and and into, you know, its components, obviously. Then the worm, over the night period while the host sleeps, this parasite creeps its way back up to the acid zone right next to the pylorus wow. and waits for the next meal because that's how it makes its living. Wow. It has no gut tract, so it absorbs everything right. through its... So it's possible it. that it could produce something that would inhibit other yes, worms? Yes, yeah. because these people are... They don't stop their food habits just because they have a tapeworm. And as we will see in the, in the paper, worms do secrete something. <laughs> they secrete they, a lot they, of they, stuff. Yeah. The paper is... Next, I presume. Yeah, before so we wait get, a minute, to, the, we before got we get to the paper, we have a definitive diagnosis. Let's just make okay. sure we get the life cycle locked right. in for everybody. Absolutely. You know, and this is the thing I always I always try to say. So if you eat the larvae in this case, and the larvae are gonna be in the undercooked yes. beef. Or the juvenile is that sometimes we'll call the juvenile, um, then that's gonna gonna go in. It's gonna have this small intestine um, location, those proglottids are gonna come out. Right. The eggs are gonna end up being dropped and then they're gonna be ingested usually by a cow. Yep. And then the eggs, you're going to have in. You can basically enter through the intestine, and then they're going to create the yep. basically the next potential, um, I guess, meal for the sure. human beings to uh, complete this cycle. And they can last in the cow for years if you keep that cow alive. Uh, they can last for years. Sometimes uh, these um, uh, these cystocerci, as they're called, lodge in places which cause pathology, and uh, in the cow. So as this cow starts to stagger and weave back and forth, it's losing its balance, they rush that one off to market. So that's, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. That's a, no, get that cow on the market before it dies because otherwise we're going to lose some money here. And so that that is thought to be one of the main ways of getting this parasite up in front to the public. But here's the nice thing. What if we ingest those eggs? Ah, great question. What if we ingest those proglotted question. segments or the eggs in there? Well, what happens? Yeah, what would happen? Well, I, I know the answer, so I'm waiting for <laughs> it. probably be digested and passed through. Why? Why, why would well, you have they, to say, that's why, correct, but why? Why wouldn't they just go right in? Why wouldn't they invade us and, and form little exactly. juveniles, little sister they, circa? They don't have the, the machinery to invade. Mm, keep guessing. They, don't, they do have the machinery to oh, invade? Yeah, they do. 
mate. One segment. Does an egg. No, one an egg. single We're egg. just talking about an egg. I thought you said a segment. No, you, just a well, segment. the segment's got lots of eggs in it. So, oh, why wouldn't those eggs? Yeah, why wouldn't the eggs? Uh, come out and enlarge? Yeah, because then the sure. cow, they're going to invade and they're going to end up in potentially Well, they're places. protected in the segment. That's why they can survive in the host to begin with, right? So the host is passing them out. They don't want to go through the stomach. They want to start in the intestine and go out there because if the egg passed in the stomach, it would get destroyed. So it's protected by the segment until it can reach the intestine and then the eggs can come out. Well, if it did so, the yeah. eggs and the cow do that. They go through the stomach. Mm. S- stomach. S- that was, that was a has hint. many stomachs. That was a hint. And you need many stomachs to uncoat this thing? You do. And we'd only have one. That's the idea. So the, the solution is we should engineer people with more stomachs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're, thank God they're protected against reacquiring this yeah. as, a, as a larval. So why does having multiple stomachs facilitate the uh, hatching? We don't know. This has been uh, selected for life mm. in two different places. And the environmental cues that this egg receives passing through the ebomosum first and then through the two stomachs triggers the hatching enzymes on the inside for the hexagans larva. Now, now, there's another parasite which looks exactly like this parasite except it has fewer branches to the uterus. Mm-hmm. That's the tinea solium. Where the eggs look the same. Where the eggs look the same. Now, unfortunately for us humans, these eggs can't tell the difference between pigs and people. Mm-hmm. So if we inject those eggs, we could develop the juvenile form of the infection in various places throughout our body. If it's in our muscle tissue, we don't even notice it. But if it's in our mm-hmm. brain yeah. or in our eye, then it becomes a big problem. And that's called neurocysticercosis right. when it's in the brain. So right. so those are the two that we really had to worry about. And thank and gosh she went to Ethiopia because they don't eat a lot of pigs there. <laughs> and we talked about neurocysticercosis. We did. Way back when. We did. We did. another podcaster, Sarah Lane, talked about her experience with it on one of her podcasts. This is true. When it's in her brain, and she was acting funny. (laughs) Well, you certainly act different. I I don't know if she was very funny. I sent her the link to our podcast on it, and she said, that was really good. You guys have a nice rapport. (laughs) Sarah Lane, tech podcaster. Yeah, that's why this woman is not quite the public health menace that that someone would be if they actually had the pork tapeworm in their intestine were shedding those eggs. Right. Uh, Is that it? That's it. That's it. We're done. Oh, and by the way, the <laughs> the outbreak of neurocysticercosis in Brooklyn, Brooklyn yeah. was the pork tapeworm, not the beef tapeworm. Not the fish tapeworm? Not the fish tapeworm. It was the pork, pork. tapeworm. Tinea solium. solium. That's right. Because tinea the, saginata, tinea solium, diphilobothrium latum. latum. Dipolidium caninum. Monesia expansa. <laughs> yeah, so what, we could go so on. So why is it? Should we, should we, sort of roll should we, should we, why is it in Monesia? Monesia, Should we well, talk about why? And, and I guess I'll just, we'll sort of not spend a lot of time on that. There are um, lots of teeny tapeworms out yeah, there. Yeah, the Monesia, they actually, interesting enough, tend to be fairly broad. Yes. Um, so, so the they description, look, now that we know that this one is long and narrow, yep. puts us more to the Tadia saginatum. That's right. Um, and in this but paper, no, I thought that was a good guess that she knew that that Dixon, existed. This yeah. paper is on open. Opistorcus viverini. Thank you for pronouncing that. That's so nice. Opistorcus. I remember we talked about this we a did. long time ago. We did, we did, we did. And now we have some science to talk so about. So this is a PLOS pathogens paper that, that uh, Daniel selected. He did. It's called Carcinogenic Parasite. Get out of here. Secretes growth factor that accelerates wound healing and potentially promotes neoplasia. This is by Michael Smout and Alex Lucas is the first and last authors, and there are many people in between. Yes. They're from Australia, Thailand. Did you know there's a place in Australia called the I3 Institute? <laughs> it's <laughs> an interesting place. Uh, where else? Australia, <laughs> Australia. Okay, so it's Thailand and Australia. Right. Now, do you think they use a lot of Apple products at that institute? It may be so. the I3 <laughs> Institute. That's right. Um Opus Thorcus viverini, that's a liver fluke. Dixon, tell us a little bit about sure. Opus Thorcus viverini. I just well, want to say it many times. Opus viverini. Thorcus, yeah, viverini. Reduvido. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should have been a parasitologist. You would have been a great parasitologist. I am. I work on <laughs> viruses. You are a great parasitologist. <laughs> no, I'm not that's great. Right. Oh, I'm, so. I work on viruses. <laughs> that's right. So, Opus Thorcus viverini is a parasite, it's a trematode. Okay. And that means that uh, it's got both male and female sex organs. Mm -hmm. And this parasite lives, it's about maybe a half an inch long. 
Mm-hmm. It's they're beautiful, by the way. They're absolutely gorgeous. When you stain these things up with the right stains, you can see all of the organ systems, and it's just it's a beautiful, symmetrically constructed organism that lives as an adult in the bile duct. Mm-hmm. And in the bile duct lives in the bile duct. How does it get there? Ah, it's you have complicated. To eat something to you have get to it. Eat something. You eat fish. Fish. Yes, raw or undercooked freshwater cyprinoids. What's a cyprinoid? It's related to goldfish. <laughs> They're related really? to goldfish. Yeah. Like, so like this koi. Is a, yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So and people they, eat these. They raise a lot of cyprinoid-like goldfish. So if you fish. cook it you, and eat yeah, it, you still get it. this thing. No, you'll kill it. But people eat them raw. Yeah, or they eat them. Um, you know, preserved in brine. It's like a pickled, usually, a yeah. Pickled fish yeah. dish, and then the stage that you ingest is actually just underneath the scales, right? And you can actually see them under a microscope. They're quite small to so see. So they say that the fish are the intermediate host. So Dixon, That's what correct. is the definitive host? We are. We are because we harbor the sexual stages, and uh, it goes in our our bile duct. It does. It, does it shed Eggs. offspring? Eggs. And fecal contamination puts them back in the water where the fish get them. In the, nope. Nope. Got one, Sorry, one more. I wish that was true, but you gotta, <laughs> we have one more. One more stage? <laughs> we have one more host. Is that another intermediate host? It is. Mm. It's the primary intermediate host, and that's snail? a snail. That's snail. Right. So the snail actually ingests the eggs. And then they hatch inside the snail. Such a complex world. It's amazing. It's amazing. And then they, and they go to the hepatopancreas. In the, in the snail. Snails don't mm-hmm. have a pancreas and a, and a liver. They have both in the same organ. Mm-hmm. And that's where this parasite develops in a very complicated series of developmental stages to eventually produce a stage which exits mm-hmm. the snail. What's that called? It's called the cicaria. Cicaria, yeah. They swim, right? They do. And this cicaria... Instead of like schistosomes penetrating the unbroken skin of a human to get the infection mm-hmm. going to the next stage, this one just finds a fish. How do you find a fish? When it's uh, sleeping? You know, it's, when you're sleeping? These are not very fast-moving fish. I They're see. like carp. And so <laughs> these metas- these uh, cicaria, yeah. they find the carp, and then they crawl underneath the scale. They drop off their tails. They round up, and they become the meta cicaria. I see. And the metasicaria is the infectious stage for humans. Now, if it weren't for humans, this would not exist, That's right? not true. They there are lots of else? reservoir hosts also. So like a bear cats. who ate a fish could get it? Yeah, or cats and dogs. Cats and dogs, okay. That's right, that's right. So it's not so just So about... you had to cut out the fishing. What are you talking well, about? You throw, throw them all back. You throw them all back, okay. <laughs> but I don't catch carp anymore. Did you ever look and see if there were some parasites any. in your fish? Did you ever see any? Uh, sure, tons. We had a course that I had to take in at the University of Michigan's Biological Station in Pelston, and I was the most popular person in our group because nobody else fished, and I did, so I used to go out and catch some trout and bring them back, and then we dissected them. a lot of adult tapeworms that live in the gut tract of trout. <laughs> and on the gills, they had... Um, Mono, I'm going to block on this name, and someone will write a letter, of course. No, no, don't they, won't cor- they won't correct you, Dixon. No, 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 we'd never do that. You're so beloved. It's nothing but, nothing but warm emails. It's, a, it's another kind of trematode that, that lives on the exterior portions mm-hmm. of gills and at, at, the, at the colorectal junction for turtles and places, things like that. They're beautiful parasites. Daniel, apparently Opus thorcus viverini is associated with liver cancer. Exactly. Did you know this? I did, actually. Did you ever, did you ever <laughs> see it? Did you ever see a so, Opus thorcus cancer? So, so that becomes the challenge. Um, have I seen Opus thorcus or have I seen Both. the cholangiocarcinoma caused by, or am I able to somehow know that the cholangiocarcinoma was actually caused? So let's so dissect I, that. Cholangiocarcinoma. <laughs> what cholangio. is that? So this is a cancer of the biliary ducts. Mm-hmm. And and this has actually become, uh, I was actually, Dix and I were chatting over lunch um, mm-hmm. the other day. I was having a bowl of soup and Dixon was having two of them. And, uh, <laughs> That's true. And, uh, deny it. <laughs> and uh, a colleague of mine has been getting a lot of patients recently. Mm-hmm. They get referred there. She's a parasitologist who have been diagnosed with this cancer of the biliary tree. And these are people in the United States who decades ago were over there in Asia yeah. working for Uncle Sam. And uh, so their period, concern, right? yeah, is that there's, you know, decades latency between the exposure mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and this uncommon cancer. Um, and actually, it's kind of challenging to um, make that connection to say that the yeah, yeah. cancer of the gallbladder of the biliary system that I'm seeing is triggered by this exposure. If it is, it's it's important for them, right, to be able to say to their families that this is something they acquired as a consequence of being in the military. Are there other causes of coli, what is it, cholangioma? Cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma, are there other causes? Um, there are other causes. I mean, a lot of them are, we'll say, probably sporadic or okay. other carcinogens, but this this is sort of a great you know, direct parasite. But if you saw someone with this cancer and you did a history and they turned out to be from Thailand, then you, that would ring a bell. That would be suspicious. Should, that mm. would be. I'm not sure that I would treat it any differently. But now we're sort <laughs> yeah, of getting right, at the right. front end. Maybe there's some way we can prevent these. So these are very uh, lethal, right? They metastasize and they don't these are bad. These are bad cancers. They are. These are. But if you catch it early, maybe you could take out the uh, gallbladder. And maybe. Maybe. Yeah, well, so that's an interesting issue. They... You know, I mentioned the gallbladder, but what this parasite likes to do, and I think Dixon will, will agree with this, is it, it likes to actually go up into the intrahepatic, so the parts okay. of the biliary system that are inside yeah, the yeah, right, right. liver. So they get pretty high up there. Um, ideally, what you want to do is treat these people, get rid of these parasites, uh, because not only can they cause this cancer, but they can cause strictures, and people can get repeated infections. Yeah. Um, basically, sort of, I'll say, upstream of these narrowings that are caused by the parasites. So, Dixon, you eat the fish, and right. the eggs are in the fish? Is Not that the correct? egg. It's called a metasicaria. Metasicaria. Yes. And that goes past your stomach, and where does it go from there? Right. Now, that's the intriguing part. How does this parasite mm-hmm. go from the gut tract to the gallbladder, right? And it doesn't just hatch and go into the gallbladder, and that's the end of it, through the bile duct. It doesn't do that at all. It crawls up and you swallow it or it no, goes into the lung. It penetrates the <laughs> gut tract yes. and crawls along the surface of the gut tract until uh, it gets to the uh, the capsule of glisten, which is the outer membrane of the liver, and it actually penetrates through the liver wow. and gets in and then starts to crawl its way, exits, until it gets right to the bile duct. So does it penetrate past the stomach? No, it gets past the stomach and then penetrates. In the duodenum or something? Yeah, like it's that. the okay. duodenum that's where right. it ex- exists. It. It's, these are, that's a weird life cycle, though. I mean, that's mm-hmm. very strange root. You'd imagine it hatches in the small intestine, it detects the bile, it migrates up, and that is not what's happening. They actually have to mm-hmm. penetrate mm-hmm. the liver and then go right. back. And down. then once in the bile tree, they it's, stop. it's shedding eggs. Yeah, well, they have to mature first. And then they are shed in the feces. And the that's right. So okay. does... The CDC actually talk about whether you need two worms or just one worm to produce a fertile offspring. I don't know if the CDC says that, but I mean, I would imagine you need two, right? To, I mean, this is the trematode. Some before, right? organisms, and this has both male and female sexual organs, um, can self fertilize. But I'm mm-hmm. I'm a little thin on knowledge on that area, so I have to yeah. defer to the internet. Yeah, we can, can Opus orcus viverini self fertilize? Opus Thorcus Viverini. <laughs> Who also wrote three operas for... <laughs> it's hermaphroditic. It's hermaphroditic. It's hermaphroditic. So it can fertilize itself. So the same worm yeah. produces eggs. So you only need one. You only need one. And so out come the eggs, and the eggs go down the bile duct into the gastrointestinal tract. They get included into the fecal mass in the large intestine. They exit and they must find fresh water in order to continue. So when they do, right, and the eggs are released from the stool itself, Mm -hmm. in some cases they hatch and then this little stage swims around and finds a snail or in other cases the snails actually ingest the eggs and then they hatch. And I think this is one of those that when they um, are ingested by snails then the eggs hatch. So this paper is trying to understand how this fluke causes cancer. True. So we know that association. We know that people with this fluke infection are mm-hmm. have a higher incidence of cancer. And uh, this, I, we, we're saying this is probably a protein lab because in prior work, they've identified a certain protein that I'll say is released by these trematodes, mm-hmm. um, which 
excreted, secreted. They say secreted in other places. They use ES because they're not really (laughs) sure whether this one is getting rid of this protein because it doesn't want it or it's getting Uh, rid of the protein because it needs it. Excreted would be you don't want it. That's right. Secreted means that you're doing something with it. Mm. So ES products. I've dealt with those all my life for trichinella. Yeah, trichinella has the same situation. Mm. We're different products, of course, but... uh, And the name of this is granulin. Granulin. Now, that's a new term. So they say there's a human version, which is a growth factor. Apparently there is. And a growth factor, of course, when you add it to cells, Dixon... It makes them divide, right? It's a mitogen. It's a mitogen. Do you eat growth factors often, Dixon? <laughs> well, we inadvertently. No, we do because a lot of our beef is pumped up with uh, growth hormone and stuff like yeah. that. So growth hormone. Yeah, we'd rather not, but I think we don't. It have a comes chance. into our milk, right? That's what I'm told. It makes big football players. <laughs> It does. That's what people want. Yeah, well, hmm, and then they bang their, fix. Then they bang their heads together. They get uh, the disease. You get a lot of money for that, right? And then banging your heads together. Then, and then the doctors then take care of them. you're knocked out. You don't know how to spend it. What do you call that when you bang your head together for years? Concussions. Concuss- but there's a... a syndrome. Well, no, there's now this, uh, this traumatic um, encephalopathy syndrome that... That oh. actually, there's a movie right called Concussion. Yeah, that's Will right. Smith yeah. is in, and right. and you know the 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 doctor apparently who is he's modeled after is getting disparaged. Can you imagine that? So <laughs> right. So we had a patient at Columbia's uh, medical center who was quite mm-hmm. famous and suffering exactly from Parkinsonian like syndrome. Oh as yeah, Muhammad Ali. That's the one. Boom, boom. That's boom. the one. You get your head punched. That happens. Yeah. yeah. They were giving him uh, L dopa, I think. Right. Yeah, they were trying. It was very sad, though. Yeah, yeah. He had a lot of uh, park. My understanding, a lot of Parkinson's type features. So I'm not sure it was yeah. just like L dopa, but also amantadine. Amanti- also, they mm-hmm. were giving him. Yes. Uh, really? Is he still alive? I think he is. Yes, he is alive. I remember at the Olympics, his hand was shaking. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. But he still did it. I think that was great. Yeah, that's true. You know what his name used to be? Yeah, Cassius Clay. How about Lou Alcindor? What did he change his name to? <laughs> Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Very good. Excellent. Hey, you're in my era. So what was know. the tragedy in his life? Kareem? Yeah. Uh, he, he went to the Lakers. His house burned down with all of his trophies in it. Is that right? Yeah. And all of his investments that he he uh, delegated to a financial group. They all turned to um, that stinks. feces, basically. So he, he's, he went to uh, Power High School here in Manhattan. He did. You know, he that's did. a very well-known high school. I did know school. that. I did know that. So this protein, uh, when you add it to cells, right. cells take it up, <clears throat> apparently, right? Yeah, this is interesting. The, you know, the, oh. the, the model um, that we think about a lot of times with growth factors or proteins that have effect on cells is we think of them often as ligands binding to a, binding to a surface receptor. Yeah, like but growth in, factor receptors on the surface, right? Yeah. And I think, I think that's, that's the rule or the model for a lot of these. In this case, hmm. this protein somehow just enters directly into the cell and is not receptor-mediated. And their their yeah. first experiments, they make this recombinant um, green fluorescent protein labeled, um, well, green fluorescent protein recombinant protein, and they can actually track where it goes into the cells. And you can see that it's actually entering the cells and ending up um, between, um, I think it's actin filaments, uh, which they label yeah. as well. So they so they talk a little bit about why they why they think this happens, and they uh, they note that it has this basic tail. And uh, not just basic. This you highly... know what the isoelectric point was for that? <laughs> it was twelve. <laughs> what does that mean, Dixon? Explain. <laughs> what is an isoelectric point? Yeah. I know what it is, but I want you. I to I know explain. exactly what it is. I used to explain do isoelectric it. focusing. Why don't you, why don't you for tell our time. listeners? What's an isoelectric? So iso- point? an isoelectric point is the pH at which the molecule is neutralized. Exactly. Yes. Why did you think I didn't know that, Vincent? Giving you hell. No, you didn't read my papers. That's what that means. <laughs> no, I actually have not read a single one of your I didn't papers. Think you had. Neither have you read any of mine. <laughs> That's all true. <laughs> I've read, you know, I've, I've, read, I've read both of your papers, but I, I can bet no one's read mine. And so. no, this read, is all you true. Read, you read uh, Dixon's papers? I have read his papers. Really? <laughs> not all of them, I but could, I have read I several. I could read them, actually. Yeah. It would be no, interesting. No, I, Why don't you, we do one of them on TWIP sometime? <laughs> you asked me once on TWIV. 300 yeah what i thought my, my <laughs> your greatest, best paper yeah you know and i gave you an excerpt but i would have picked another paper if i had time to think so about it so pick one and let's do yeah, it i'd love to do that we that will honor great. you oh i would be very honored because fallacy is always <laughs> no, no, I, I, so i used to use something called preparative isoelectric focusing so what does it mean if a protein has a 
isoelectric point of 12. Oh my God. So in other words, at pH 12, which is incredibly basic. Alkaline, yeah, the rest of the molecule is probably dissolved at that point, but maybe that's the mechanism protein. for entry. So the, the, when they add this protein to cells, they say it doesn't go to any particular place that would be involved in you know receptors or endosomes. or It just seems to be sitting there. So that's why they say it's an unusual. Blast is way However, this protein is causing cells to divide. Yeah. It's unusual, yeah, which mm-hmm. is pretty cool. Now, De- Dixon, yes. I always want to call you Devin. I don't know why. Uh, because I'm... <laughs> I when you know. take uh, ESs from trichinella yeah. and you add them to cells, yeah, do yeah. they also get taken up? We, we've we tried it. Um, uh, you did. The, by pinocytosis, because I think that's the way proteins are usually taken up by cells. But there's no receptor. There's for no the, receptor. Okay. And then they're degraded by lysosomal process. So the answer is no. We've also tried to inject them directly into muscle cells to see if we can get them to transform into a nurse cell. And that didn't work out too well either. But there was a, a group from Korea that actually claimed to have some success with some of the ES products from Trichinella mm-hmm. to get them to go part of the way towards a nurse cell. So um, it's possible okay. that, um, you know. So then they want to know the role of this protein ah, in uh, well. proliferation and ro- wound healing in particular. Mm-hmm. Right. So they, they, they do, first they do a cool experiment where they, they take the flukes and they silence this, the, G, the mRNA encoding this, uh, what's the name of it again? Can we call it OVGRN? <laughs> OVGYN. <laughs> OVGYN. <laughs> so OV, OV granulin. Basically yeah, OV granulin. the opistorcus. So they silence it, and they show that the supernatants that the flukes produce yeah, yeah. have reduced proliferative induction on cells. So they use cancer cells in culture, right? Uh, yeah, they, they take a small cells. cell cancer line. And, yeah. you know, yeah, people can jump and say, oh, my gosh, you're using a cancer. But basically, all they're doing at this point, they're not looking at developing cancer, they're saying, will these cells proliferate? And if we scratch across a monolayer of cells, creating basically a wound, by adding the supernatant with this growth factor, will they move in and close yeah. the wound? They use this as a model of wound healing, yeah. right? So it's, a, it's, so a, it's a monolayer of cells. Yeah. <laughs> you scratch. You Now in the microscope, you can see a zone of clearance. Mm-hmm. And then if you don't treat, if you just add the soup from this fluke uh, untreated, it will rapidly cause the cells to divide and close in. But if right. you knock down the granulin with siRNA... And they knock then, it down 97%, so it pretty inhibits, good knockdown. It inhibits the closure of this cell culture wound, right. if you will. So It's cool. What is this worm using it for in vivo? My guess, Dixon, if you're interested... I'm very interested. <laughs> and I that, promise I'll uh, read your papers also. You don't have to read them. It's, <laughs> it's long ago. Now, when we publish new ones in the future... Oh, uh, well, you give me the reprints, then. Well, you can definitely uh, talk about them. I, my guess is that when this uh, fluke is infecting you... Yes. There's damage caused, perhaps by the immune response, hmm. and the, the fluke doesn't like that, so it's repairing it. Ooh. Well, there's another you, alternative. But that's probably not right. So now. what does the fluke eat? To stay alive for that many years. Let's see. It's in the bile duct. And it has a gut tract, by the way. As opposed to the eating? tapeworms, this worm has a gut tract. No, no, no. Raw liver? It's, <laughs> that's foie gras, the human. <laughs> what is it eating? What is it eating? <laughs> it, it eats epithelial cells of the bile So it duct. likes them to proliferate. So it eats them and then backs off and secretes this protein and it regenerates so, its food. I mean, the, the wound healing is really... And an acceleration of cell proliferation Correct. in part, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe other things as well, but proliferation is a big part of it. That's right. So maybe the the, the primary activity of granulin is to cause cell division, yes. but in a wound model, it also heals the wound. Because, but of course. Yeah. But this, this worm will then go and mow that lawn, so to speak, again, back mm-hmm. off, secrete it, maybe. grow new. And if you continue to injure the same area again and again and again, it's obvious that eventually one of those epithelial cells is going to make a mistake in its division cycle and so maybe you, become a cancer. Do you think the wound healing is a bona fide activity of this protein, or is it just an effect of being mitogenic? I think, personally, mm-hmm. that this is an essential component of this worm's life. Wound healing, yeah. Not wound healing. It's generating more food. Uh, I understand that, but that's right. not what I asked you. Let me ask Daniel. Try Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so the protein is mitogenic, clearly. Clearly it mitogenic. It causes cell division. Is the wound healing simply a reflection of that, or is there other 
processes? Or are there other processes? Well, I think we're going to learn that there's other processes in addition to the mitogenesis Maybe. that are involved. Um, and we'll, like when we get to the angiogenesis. So next they do a mouse wound healing experiment. Can True. you explain that to so us, Dan? Now, so now rather than just an in vitro model where they scratch a monolayer of cells, they're actually going to take these poor mice and they're going to wound them. wound them. They're going to scratch them. More than just scratch it's, them. Really and it fiction? actually... It's, yeah, I was, you know, IRB would have trouble with this one. I think. Well, well, so this goes to the Iacuc, right? This is the uh, mm. the vertebrate. They don't um, like you hurting animals. They yeah. Don't. So, so what they do here is they actually wound. They do a two millimeter incision back behind the ears of the mice. I'm pointing to two myself. Two millimeter deep. They cut with a scalpel, right? It's not much, but for it's a mouse, not, that not, might it's be a actually, significant It's actually a, um, it's a five millimeter diameter punch biopsy. Oh, it's a punch biopsy. It's yeah, a yeah. punch biopsy. And they're doing this in the Balb C mice. Right. And then what they're going to do is then they're going to follow this over two and four days to see what kind of wound healing occurs when they apply this recombinant protein or they just let it right. you know, control. So they, they put the protein on top of the wound. Mm-hmm. And then Daniel, they say they put a spray plaster. There's a membrane. What is that sort. for? Just so that it doesn't I mean, just it to hold it in place and so it keeps doesn't just keep bleeding and right. yeah. etc. Get infected. I don't think it's bleeding though. I think that they didn't go down that deep. No, I don't think so. You know, blood vessels in your skin. Uh, there are blood vessels in your skin, but I'm actually not seeing any um, obvious bleeding in okay. these punch. Okay, so the plaster is just to keep it contained. Keep it in, moist. Right? That's moist. Right. Moist. And what do they find? Uh, they actually find that when you um, when you go ahead and you apply this, uh, we'll call it growth factor, the OV granulin, so recombinant, recombinant protein, right? um, that you end up with improved um, wound healing. So let's look at the amount. Right. And they even do it. They even do a dose response. Fifty-six picomoles exactly. a day. Exactly. And how many protein <laughs> molecules would that be? Uh, who do you think I am, Avogadro? So one mole, one mole would be Avogadro's number. Yeah, right. right. This is like a billionth of a six point oh two three times ten to the twenty three. Is it? It's pretty, pretty impressive. That's one mole. Well, wow, you got that kills. memorized. Yeah, it's a great number, and this would be a, pico, a fraction of that. We could calculate it, couldn't we? We could do. You know what? I bet. Come on, you're Wolfram, a virologist. I bet you can Wolfram do this. Alpha has. <laughs> That uh, that number you could type it. Do you know? I'm Wolf sure there's an after? iPhone app. Paras- <laughs> parasitologists never get to that lower number. I can guarantee you. You know, we want to see the worm. We want to see the egg. Uh, to see the molecule, that's a little tougher. So that you've got you mo- molecule to picomole. Oh, that, like, I thought Google would do it for you. Just like so. What's the wait a minute? What's the molecular weight of the uh, compound first? No, numbers. It doesn't matter. How many molecules are we talking about? It doesn't matter. The molecular weight doesn't matter. Okay. A mole of any compound is 6 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Bingo. So I'm asking how many molecules in a 54 picomoles. All right. So I want to know one picomole is... Oh, six times ten. Why can't you give me it in uh, exponential? <laughs> six times ten to the one, two, three, four, five, oh, six, brother. seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Six times ten to the eleventh molecules is one picomole. Okay, that's a lot of this molecules. This is a very nice conversion thing here. <laughs> you can type in either molecules or picomoles. And how many euros does that represent? <laughs> yeah. Euros is not much different from dollars these Not days. anymore. That's right. It's that's unfortunate because I'm getting paid in euros. And but it's the pound, the English pound, is much higher than the dollar right now. 6.022, 145 uh, times 10 to the 23. Avogadro. It's a wonderful molecule. Number. It's a number. It's a wonderful wonderful number. That's but right. you know, there are more phages on Earth than Avogadro's <laughs> number. Many, many more. Ten to the thirty-first. That's amazing. That's just so they're getting a lot of molecules a day, and it helps yeah. uh, heal this wound, right? Yeah. You believe well, maybe, it? Maybe one molecule per cell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they're. <clears throat> you know. In that little area, there may be that many cells. So it it accelerates wound repair in a mouse model. Right, right. Yes. but it not only did that, it did. But then there's the angiogenesis. Right, it's Dixon, angiogenesis. I know, I know. <laughs> you used to do this. I got, z- I got zipped up for this one. What, is, an- what is angiogenesis? Well, it's blood vessel formation. Now remember, really? this worm induces a tumor. Yes. So tumors, maybe, maybe it's one of the qualities of a solid tumor is blood vessel formation. That's a good question, Dixon. I mean, Daniel, <laughs> have they shown that if you infect an animal with this? Uh, that it will cause a tumor, or is that 
not possible because it doesn't infect non-humans. I don't know infect cats and dogs. Can you make two? Yeah, I'm just I, I just don't know if I am uh, if I you know I'm thinking about the time scale. Is it a time scale? Is it a yeah. doable experiment? Yeah, right, right. Um, too long. Yeah, right. I don't know if it's been done, but I would so, that would be my worry about it. But you've got humanized mice and you've got human tumors. You could possibly mm. do a transfer and see if that works. Yeah, but you want to put this. Um, Opus thorcus um, viverini oh, into right. an animal, and then you know, wait twenty years. Right, I could write a grant for that. Why did they look <laughs> at angiogenesis, the development of new capillaries? Well, because I think they wanted to connect it back up with the tumor uh, promoting uh, qualities of. Okay, the, and next, what's the other possibility? Uh, <laughs> Well, wound healing. Hint, oh, yeah, wound okay. Healing. Good. Okay. So to wo- wound heal. Wound heal. To heal wounds, yeah. you need blood vessels. Oh, sure. You need to correct? drop the oxygen level first, and then you get hypoxia inducible factors. And then you've okay. got little uh, epithelial cells from the vessels that eat their way through the tissue using metalloproteases. Mm-hmm. And there's mitogens associated with this, too. And then there's a bunch of inhibitors that are produced as the result of it lysing its way through tissue okay. that stems from collagen so, 4 breakdown. Do you know this model for angiogenesis, this chorioallantoic membrane? Yeah, anything? I do know. It's an egg model. You can actually watch vessels migrate towards the source of the angiogenic. So you open up an, a fertilized egg? And Yes, and you put a little block. It's like um, agarose. Mm-hmm. It's been... Um, uh, suffi- infused with this protein, and you put it directly on top of the allantoic membrane, mm. and then you wait. You put a little window of glass over it and seal it off so it doesn't dry out, and you can actually photograph the angiogenic process like this. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit clumsy, but quail eggs are easy to work with. So you did this with trichinella. I didn't, but other people did. Yeah, There's a trichinella protein that's also angiogenic. Or maybe several. Several. That's right. Mm. But we, we did it in situ, in the animal, using the cremaster muscle. So we could actually see this, you know, directly. Rather than using a model for this, we could use the actual animal to, to look. So what did they find? Right. What did they find? <laughs> back it's to a, our it's story. A really, it's a really simple. Now, kids, back really to our story of uh, Batman so They actually versus... go ahead and they do a blood vessel count. And they find count the that vessels, they count yeah. the blood vessels. Yeah. And they find a dose re- response curve that when you add two... Pycomoles, you get a certain increase, which is statistically significant. And when you add twenty pycomoles, you get, you know, much more significant. So uh, the the control, the media control, is like a hundred and ten. It looks like yeah. you yeah. get a hundred and twenty-five with two pycomoles, and you get a hundred and I don't know seventy-five yeah. with. It's 20. a big deal. Is that a lot, Dixon? It is. It is a lot. I'm just asking because I'm not familiar with the numbers. Well, even in that <laughs> essay, well, I think as long as it's a dose-response curve, yeah. it doesn't matter what the numbers are. It matters that it's a linear curve. To a point, I think they would probably saturate that at some point. By the way, we forgot to mention that in the uh, – did they do – in that wound healing experiment, did they actually just – they just used recombinant protein, didn't they? Okay. Yeah, Never just mind. a recombinant OV – GRN1. And here, the same thing, and it stimulates blood vessel formation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, since this is a protein lab, they want to know what proteins are being turned on, right, by by granulin. And this, if you read this paragraph, this is an open access paper. This is the most obscure paragraph in the entire paper, (laughs) because it was probably written by the computational biologist who did the work. So read that paragraph. They grabbed him and they said, would you write this paragraph? It's so funny. Using the scaffold program, we reliably validated 215 proteins in cholangiocytes and identified by mascot compared to cells at baseline and subsequent intervals. Um, Then they talk about keg pathways and occluded... Euclidean distance clustering. Euclidean. Euclidean. It's a, it's a of Greek geometry. Yeah, yeah, I know Euclidean. <laughs> group Z and group Y protein. And it's quite obscure. The bottom line is that proteins associated with the spliceosome go up <laughs> when you add this protein to cells. So, you know, a mitogen would be expected to do that. Turn on, splicing, raise it. But the more interesting result is when they looked at RNA which they should have done from the beginning instead of looking at proteins, because as they say... You're not yelling at them, are you? No, mass spectrometry is constrained in its ability to characterize changes in low-abundance proteins. True. So if you wrote a grant application to just use mass spec, they would probably uh, not fund you and say, would, it's not sensitive enough. That's probably right. So they they're basically they're adding this granulin to cells, then they use arrays to say what goes up. Yeah, yeah. And they say 30 genes went up, 
and these are in, in cytokines and kinases. And one of them was interleukin-8. It's one of your favorite proteins. It is. What does it do? Uh, that's, a key, it that's a cytokine, interleukin-8. What does it do? Well, these... That's a good question now. That's the next paper, right? Figuring out what yeah, the role no, of these right. is. That's right. So is that we an know anti-inflammatory interleukin or we know that the protein does uh, induces cell division and yeah. wound healing. Yeah. And now the question is if you knock each of these down individually yeah. in these models, yeah. what's going to be the effect and I'm sure so they're doing it. Why doesn't this worm induce a scar? I mean, why doesn't that area that's been damaged again and again and again Scar over, I, I you know, think, with well, tissue it, rather than it, epithelial cells. Well, I think it, it actually, there is a scar, which is the concern, which we talked about early on, where you the get these sort of these of the strictures, bile. yeah, with, with infection behind them. So I think there is um, there is okay. a problem. You're not just getting wonderful okay. cell proliferation. You're actually getting a scarring phenomenon. Right. ILA is an important mediator of the innate immune system response. Okay. So toll-like receptors are important here then. Because this may not have anything to do with granulin we have to see right Dixon right how far away in Euclidean distances <laughs> <laughs> is that from the <laughs> not the spliceosome yeah. but the inflammasome well no, really remember I mean, the spliceosome is is needed for expression of all genes yeah, but of course because most of them are spliced yeah. so that's basically you know you're turning that up to turn on these uh, yeah, 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 yeah. cytokine genes and so forth but what they're doing is the real question so we don't know so the inflammasome, they, maybe they should look at that next or something. And, no, and, I don't think they... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. They it, should look at these individually yeah, exactly. and, and knock them down and see is if they Is there infect. any inflammation associated with Ophistorcus viverini? And if they're... No, that should be known, right? Well, this is not well explored in humans because... By the time you have cancer, it's yeah, too it's, late. And it probably is... The cancer is probably somewhere else. There's, there's probably inflammation, right? Well, I mean, I would think with IL-8, you're going to get neutrophil... Um, mm you know, influx because it's going to bring, it's a neutrophil chemotaxic factor. So you got TNF to we'll look at, and they did mention TNF in here someplace. But, um. So they suggest using this protein as an anti-cancer vaccine. Right. right? So they, yeah, they have, they, they take two spins. They're going <laughs> to, what is they're yes. going to block we the activity, they're going to block the activity in people who are infected. I guess right. they right. probably just treat them and get rid of the worm. But anyway, no, they're not going to do it. They're going to block this <laughs> and prevent yes. from getting cancer. Maybe it has, maybe it has <laughs> broader <laughs> applicability than to just this cancer. Yeah, right? and that's that's interesting. On the other hand, it could have side effects, right? Yeah. Because if you're inhibiting tissue remodeling and healing, that could be bad if you scrape your knee. It could it may really never heal. be bad for this. Or if you have surgery, it will never heal. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah, I guess they're they're hoping that this is specific for the cholangiocytes, for those cells that are in the biliary tree. So, so you mentioned we could just treat the worm. What would, <laughs> what would you treat this worm with? <laughs> I guess that's an issue. What, do, what, what is the treatment do, uh, do for Bithyanol. I think it's bithyanol. Is that bad? Uh, it's not prosequential, I don't think. Although, you know, I've been wrong many times on this show. But I, I think I remember that these flukes that live in the liver are difficult to treat. So uh, the CDC is recommending prosequential. And, and, I, and I, I always say, you know, this is, you know, we always have to, how do we remember a treatment for everything under the sun? It's that yeah. you could treat almost all flukes with prosequential except for... Fasciola. <laughs> Where we use triclobendazole. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. That was it. Daniel, that was you, it. you said this could be specific for these uh, bile duct cells, but the fact that it's simply taken up in a receptor independent I'm, fashion. I'm being friendly. Might, <laughs> might <laughs> indicate that it could get into other cells. In fact, in this paper, what cells, they use a uh, cholangioma cell line, not angioma, chol cholecarcinoma cell line, right? Right. But what was the other? Cell line that well, they the other use. was a small cell lung cancer. They're both right? cancer. They should do this yeah. with other cells to see if like, HeLa cells do HeLa cells take this up yeah. or, an, or some other cell type it would be interesting. Again, another cat, and and that is, I think, you know, if our right. listeners are saying, why did they do all these experiments with cancer cells? It's that uh, our basically our cell lines are cancer cells. They're cells that that we can use in culture because they don't die; they continue to proliferate. Exactly. Uh, but you know, they could do these experiments with some primary cells. They could easily. They could. You know, and they'll only last so many replicative cycles before they yeah, die out, yeah, but at least you right. could look um, at the effect here. So let's say, for instance, mm -hmm. you decided to do this experiment in C2 in a live situation using People? cats. Cats? Hey, let's use well, a cat. What are you going to do? I can keep a cat alive for maybe 10 years. Oh, and give it this parasite? <laughs> Do you think you're going to get a grant for 10 years to look no, down but the road hopefully, to see if maybe it induces a tumor in a cat? I don't think no, so. But hopefully in a rodent. 
it rodents would, are too short lived. It would work quicker because they are basically compressed. Stop messing with the mic. You're making noise. I'm <laughs> trying not to make any noise, but I'm getting animated because I'm trying to tell you that to, if that were a model that you suggested to an NIH review committee, they wouldn't give you the money. Because well, you'd have to have term. the results already, Dixon. You know that. <laughs> but I think what do they want to do? They want to make a CRISPR Cas9. Um, OVGRN deficient um, liver fluke, yeah. liver fluke, and then they're gonna, you know, half your cats get that, and half the cats get the regular ones, and you see if you know, twenty years from now, there's a difference in the cancer rates. I, I agree that if it takes <laughs> a long time, it's not going to work. Yeah, but but let me tell you, true. Stanley Prusiner, when he first studied prions, oh yeah, yeah he had a problem. They took years That's to make did. disease in hamsters. No, you're right. But he did it. Yeah. He persisted That's and. True. Eventually, he figured out ways to make it go quicker. But, so one, of, yeah. one of the authors referred to in this paper is Rick Maisels. I know Rick Maisels. He's in uh, England. And he works on filariasis. And filariasis is a long-term infection also in animals even. Mm-hmm. So you have to be prepared to look down the road a long way in order to get a result that might be useful to uh, medicine. Yeah, but they may, but they may as you as Vincent brought up, they may they may actually go ahead and create a way to accelerate the development of biliary cancers, and and then if you can do it in a more reasonable period of time, but they also and I'll say this is maybe the part that I think is they say well what about a potential therapeutic what about a plowshare approach maybe we can use yep. this protein yep. 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 To, to heal wounds, to heal wounds. Yeah. that's right and you know and then you're not exposing cells to this for decades you're exposing it for we see a few days and you is, can get is a is there a need for this Daniel. I think I think they're definitely. They said ulcers in type one diabetics. Well, that, that is a that's a become a huge problem. I mean, worldwide, you know, what was it? We we have this um, epidemic of obesity and starvation at that's the same type time, two. right? That's type two. And and but it's the type two diabetes that are getting these wounds, and and we are, are getting really? these wounds yeah. in the first world, but also these wounds now in the developing world. Mm. <clears throat> so this is a global challenge, and when these wounds are open and they're not healing, and the blood vessels are not growing in because of all the effects of diabetes, these, these become just horrible. No, I agree. I um, totally so, agree. you know, in all honesty, um, if there was a therapy that could promote wound healing of those, or even when someone gets, let's say, a decubitus ulcer, yeah. where they're laying in bed, these bed sores, mm-hmm. and they just won't heal, um, really a lot of areas where wound healing, um, yeah. improved wound healing would be fantastic. Right. All right. See, that's why it's good to have a doc on the show. There you go. Because I would say, uh, what? They just sew it up. What's the problem? (laughs) Now, they say in the beginning of this paper, uh, the cancer caused by this fluke is likely multifactorial involving immunopathogenesis, uh, dietary carcinogens. Mm -hmm. Co-carcinogens. It says increased consumption of dietary and the secretion of parasite proteins that are mitogenic. Right. So, Dixon, here's my question to Uh you. Why? test. And there's an answer. (laughs) from the virus world, why would a mitogenic situation of mitogenic protein lead to cancer? Because given enough division cycles, there's a mistake that is made. Unbelievable. There's I'm, a, like I'm a very mutation, impressed. like I'm a impressed. mutation, you know, you get these mutants. Very good. Do you know roughly you how many- you got to kill them all, otherwise many, they'll take over the world. How many mutations <laughs> we think you need to eventually accumulate to cause cancer? Mm, I'm not going to even- It's about a guess. dozen. Just 12. It's about a dozen. So there are stages of cancer development. Well, you, this get, I know, you start to accumulate because the problem is most yeah, of our cells yeah. don't divide continuously. Because as you say, you make mistakes you when you do that. And so viruses, which make cells divide forever, so they cause cancer because of that. And of course, yeah. they want the cells to divide because they need a living cell in, in which so to How replicate. many more mistakes do I have to go before I become a tumor? <laughs> well, there may be a cell in you. about nine You right may now. have six or nine. It depends on yeah. you know whether you've encountered okay. carcinogens or mutagenic situations. Yeah, so or for- your genetics predispose you. Errors in genes that correct mistakes, they can be defective and predispose oh, you to, I hear to that. tumors. I hear and of course, that. your checkpoint proteins, the ones that monitor damage yeah, to DNA, yeah, yeah, they yeah. could be defective in themselves. This is all true. So our last That's case that we had on a fluke was fasciola hepatica. Yes. And you yeah, diagnosed yeah. it by doing ultrasound. You could see the tunnels for this thing, right? Yeah. Now you yeah. won't see the tunnels from this one because it's too small. So, so I want to go back to fasciola just for a moment because it lives by eating epithelial cells also. Mm-hmm. That's its total diet, basically. It eats liver cells as well, but it eats epithelium as well. Okay. So I knew someone who actually worked on this, 
And unfortunately, this, this poor individual just passed away recently. His name was George Hillier, and he worked down at, at the University of Puerto Rico, and then finally he became the chancellor for the university system in Puerto Rico. So he was a big it was a big deal, basically. And he worked on fasciola, and he worked on schistosomes. And he and I were very good friends, and we saw each other at meetings. I'll miss his company. I haven't seen him in years, but uh, I just got the notice that he had passed. So fasciola has another strategy for mm-hmm. generating its food supply, which is a lawn of epithelium. Do you know what it does? It secretes proline. And proline turns out to be a mitogenic amino acid in high concentration. And this worm secretes a lawn of cell. Uh, uh, it, it, it sort of feeds this epithelium in front of it with proline. It then goes and mows that lawn and goes back up to where it was and secretes more proline and out comes more cells. And, and I don't think there's a tumor associated with this because it's not the same mechanism. But I was surprised to learn that proline could be a uh, mitogenic. Do you know that T. cruzi encodes a proline racemase? Look at you. A racemase that changes the <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, chemical it. configuration of the I proline. It, the chiral activity. Exactly. So maybe um, <sighs> that it's mitogenic. Yeah. It, that pr- that enzyme is mitogenic. Isn't that It changes the proline. Isn't that Maybe T. cruzi has a similar goal, right? <sighs> Amazing. Um, I think we need to do a case study. We do. Right, okay. Daniel? Do you yes. have another one for stump us? Stump the stars? I do. I, do. Stars. I have a case. Or, as they said on Car Talk, stump the chumps? So stump the docks. Can we come up with something? Stump the docks. Stump the docks, not dump. What's no. another word? <laughs> uh, something, we need something with a D yeah. that implies stumping. Dumbing. Defeat, <laughs> defeat the docks? Defeat the docks. Something like da, that. Da, 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 da. All right. Let's defeat the docks. Okay. So here's the case. and give everybody a little bit of a, a warning about it. I will say uh, <laughs> there's nothing here. Oh, okay. Dick said that. I just don't want you to show yeah, your I, hand I, right I'm away. Not, I'm not showing. <laughs> there's nothing here. You could even okay. look over and cheat. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I'm going to say this is a rather uncommon parasite. I, I don't even think you guys covered it in those first 20. So I'm, I'm throwing that out as okay. a hint. This is not a common. This okay. is not a common one. People are going to probably have to Google. Um, you know, it is mentioned in that parasitic diseases textbook. So it does get <laughs> mentioned. So it's not, it's not horribly obscure. And um, I'm, I'm going to leave out a, a little, some information here and there. But I'm going to give people the information that they should be able to um, generate a good differential force. So we have a young girl meaning less than 10 years of age, Mm. and she's brought in by her parents from a rural area to the regional hospital with fever and diarrhea that's been going on for two weeks. Um, This young girl does not report any blood in the stools. Parents um, say this is true. But the parents do give us this interesting little bit of history. They say that a few weeks prior to any of the problems, the young girl had accompanied her family on a pig hunting trip. Yes, a pig hunting trip. Yeah. Hunting with, um, with guns or something? Wild boar or just... Wild pigs? Wild, wild pigs. Wild wild pigs. Wild wait, you didn't even say where this is. Did you say the... I know, I'm not even going to tell you that. You're not yeah, even going to tell us. And the reason area. I'm not going to tell you that is that they didn't realize that this parasite was endemic in this area until they find it. So so I, I didn't want okay. people to, to jump pig, and say... How are they hunting the pigs? With spears or guns? <laughs> It's guns. <laughs> Not <laughs> it's arrows. A modern, arrows. It's a modern world. Guns. Um, and they do say that although the girl, as everyone else, did consume pig on this trip, um, they are careful and all the meat was very well cooked. Okay. Um, did she participate in the preparation of the meat? Uh, yes. She was involved. And she involves cutting it up with sharp knives, right? They're cutting it up with sharp knives and... <laughs> yes. Um, nobody, else to is, the chase. nobody else is sick. <laughs> right. This young girl is um, very healthy. Mm. Um, she's had no surgery. She doesn't have any allergies. I will say that both parents have diabetes. Type 2. <laughs> oh, they eat a lot of pig. That must have <laughs> they, protected they, them they, against they, the, <laughs> the infection. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she's not, the little girl has not taken any medications. Um, she lives with her parents, and she has, um, I believe it's four other brothers, actually. So the two symptoms are diarrhea and fever. Diarrhea and fever. fever. Any weight and this loss? This has been going on for a few weeks. Um, there's a little bit of weight loss. Yeah, I would imagine so. You know. And how soon after they got back from the pig hunt did these symptoms start? A few weeks. 
Um, it's a few weeks. Yeah, few weeks, meaning two weeks, three few weeks, weeks five three, weeks. Yeah, say. yeah, it was at least a couple of weeks after when she, you know, remember we're getting this from she, this uh, little girl and her did family. Did she get cut when when she was preparing the meat? She does not report any cuts. Did she wash her hands after preparing the meat? Probably well, they, wasn't anywhere. I mean, they're out. Yeah, they're, they're out. out in the woods. They're out in the woods hunting. Okay. This is a pig. It's a pig. And this is close to the mic. Like Kentucky or Tennessee. He's not going to tell us. I'm not going to tell well, you. What we know is that but I will, parents. Because they didn't think they had the parasite, so it triggered was, some But I will say it was outside the U.S. This it was outside the U.S. So he, they brought her from a rural area to the regional hospital. Right. Yeah. Which could be in the U.S., but you're saying it's outside the it's U.S. outside the U.S. Wow. And I may never actually tell you the actual country, just for okay. sort of privacy Political issues. issues, but... Ah. So, that so was we not want to say some more things? So um, I'm not going to ask my usual questions. No, please. <laughs> she's not sexually active. No, she's less than 10 years old, yes. although... You can't yeah, she's, judge. She's, she's, she's not. I mean, there are certain cultures where that might be an issue, but she's less than 10 in right. most cultures now, in this culture now. And how many other people were on this trip besides her parents? Um, you know, it's just the parents, the siblings, her... Siblings. And How many did, siblings? So four, four, four brothers. brothers. Four. So there's seven of them. So they seven. all participated in preparing the, the meat from the pig? No, it was really her mom and her, you know, the mainly the mom was so doing the work. What did they do? They killed the pig in the field, and then they dressed it they in, dressed the field, in the field, mm-hmm. yeah. and then they took the I mean, the they're meat, out there camping on this trip, so they're and they cooked dressing it, out it there. there, and they cook it out there. On a fire. Mm-hmm. And then they eat. And some they make of it sure there. it's really well cooked, right? And then they eat some of it. Then they bring some more home, right? They bring, yep, they bring. They bring the home. uncooked meat home, mm-hmm. and I presume they have a box or a container yeah. that they put it in, and then they bring it home. Do they have refrigerators and freezers? I do not know. I do not know. And then later they ate more of the meat, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. And everybody ate it. Yes. Hmm. But only the mother. But and only daughter the mother and the daughter prepared, prepared it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very telling. It sounds like yeah, it's. It sounds like what you were talking about in Brooklyn. <laughs> the tapeworm paper, but it's a rare right. parasite. That's right. That's right. This is very rare. Okay, I will tell no you. Uh, I will tell you the physical exam. <laughs> Please do. Um, she does have a fever. The document a low grade fever. Um, she has some mild abdominal discomfort. Is the when fever they push periodic her or steady? Um, we don't get that information. Ah, okay. Mild abdominal. Distension, pain? No, just discomfort. When they push in her belly, it's a little oh. uncomfortable. Not horribly uncomfortable, just a little uncomfortable. Any particular quadrant? No. <laughs> diffusely. Diffuse. I, I like that. He's breaking it down into quadrants. Epigastric. So just diffusely <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, any blood work done? No. Yes. She has, um, right. what we say is, she has slight microcytic anemia, meaning her red blood cell count is slightly low and the size of the cells they're slightly smaller than normal she also has a white blood cell count done and um, it is normal except she has no eosinophils none zip zip no no basophils either (laughs) well i can ask (laughs) no they actually didn't report any basophils okay and what does the red cell count Hematocrit. Um, I'm just going to say it was slightly below normal. Slightly, because the cells are smaller. So, so the pack. cells are a little smaller. Maybe the so numbers normal, are the same, but the sizes are now reduced. Yeah, he said it was anemic. Yeah, she's so she's, anemic. she has slight anemia. Slight anemia. Lovely. Yep. Slight anemia. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna tell you that. Oh, the, then they did a blood smear. Um, and I, the blood smear is negative. Did they did do a blood smear, which is negative. They did blood cultures. Nothing grew. They then stool. and this is they do a stool examination. Right. And the stool examination is is where we're going to get our answer. So they're going to look at the stool and they're going to see something in the stool. Um, something. Something. He's not going to tell us because there <laughs> will give it away. These little white worms about two inches long. That- <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't do it twice in a row. Oh, you, you, as Wink says. You know says. what? <laughs> this could be the one time he did. I don't think he will. So the answer is in the stool. Yep. It's not but in it's blood. Gonna, but, and it, but it's the, the microscopy of the stool that's no, going to give it to us. This is, and they're not going to see anything so big that you can see with the naked eye. Right. Very no, good. of course not. I got well, no, parasite stuff. eggs, you can't see those with your naked eye. Helmet eggs, you can't see those with your naked eye. So that, that this could be anything. Could be anything. It could be, could be could a be lot of protozoans. Things. It could be, if you're sticking to the, the uh, mantra of this program, 
But you're, gonna, you're not going to. Oh, it's a parasite. You're not going to twip us up on anything no, here. No. It's a parasite, and it's okay. coming from pigs, most likely. Mm, that's an interesting assumption. Well, that's yeah. all the info we got. Yeah, but that could be a red herring. Herring. It's, it's it's, red I'm, fr- I'm being friendly here. She's being very friendly. This, and this is, okay. I will say, it's a very accurate history. The food, the, the, okay. all the pig that they ate, was very okay. well cooked. Well, she didn't catch it by eating it. She well, the preparation. It just, preparation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you wipe your mouth, you know, your eyes. Get a little blood on your hand. There's no place to wash your hands. Tell me about that. So you must know what can be caught from wild pigs, Dixon. It's a rare parasite. So it's people, a rare can, people parasite. Can, people can let us know. They can send in They'll their send uh, in send your in their, guesses, send in your guesses. Your you know where to send them, Dixon? Differential diagnosis. Whip at microbe.tv. New yes. email. I have two... Short email to read here. Please. First is a suggested pick of the week from Ramon, who is in Ibiza, Spain. Ramon, a pick of the week we don't usually do, but we'll let Ramon make a pick of the week. This is an article called Ancient Rome Was Infested with Human Parasites. Yeah, well. Poop poop show. It's not surprising. No, of course not. So this is a study where they got, um, you know, a 500-year-old latrine. I'm sorry, not 500-year-old. It's got to be more than that, yeah, right? Yeah, quite a bit more. So what did they do in this um, coprolites, fossilized yeah. excrement yeah. Yeah. in latrines <laughs> from Rome? You bet. And they had, do you know what? want to know what they had, Dixon? What they Boy, found? if I had to guess, I could just tick off the list of things that we've already covered. Whipworm, roundworm, yep, and tamoeba. Right. That's right. By the way, they they found they think the the grave site of Richard the Third in England, and I think I mentioned this on one of our shows. They found an enormous number of ascaris associated with this king. So mm-hmm. um, even the king wasn't protected against the uh, ravages of the parasite world. This is uh, published Dixon in yes the journal of. Called Parasitology, which you've probably published in. Yep, I have. It was published in January, and the, the title is Human Parasites in the Roman World, Health uh-huh. Consequences of Conquering an Empire. So well, they got Trichurus, Ascaris, and Tamoeba. This would suggest that public sanitation measures were insufficient to protect the population. Well. Ectoparasites have been found. Fleas, head lice, body lice, pubic sure, lice, and sure, bed bugs. Sure. And they also found delousing combs. Oh, nice. You know, it remains. You know, Rome used to throw its garbage out into the streets. Fish tapeworms as well. Really? This evidence fails to demonstrate that the Roman culture of regular <laughs> bathing reduced the prevalence. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> certainly not going to work anyway. I'm not sure you're going to bathe away any yeah, of those bathing. worms. No, right? that's, so that's, a, that's a red herring. <laughs> yes. Then we have an email from David who's late on... Uh, I guess. I think oh, this I was, was going to say one. hi to Ramon. Actually, a good friend of mine you know is from Ibiza, Spain, Ibiza. which is a little island, right? Yes, there, that's right. There's what, Menorca, Ibiza, and there's, I think, a third one. But yeah, a good friend of mine, um, Juan Carlos, Juan Rico Carlos, yeah. Juan Carlos lives from is, Ibiza. This right. is an, it's one of the Balearic Islands in the Mediterranean Sea, well known for the lively nightlife scene. Look at that. That was why Juan Carlos felt he had to leave. It was just too, <laughs> too, much, too, much, just too much distraction, <laughs> and he was a serious guy. I uh, got it. It is on the <laughs> eastern coast, off the eastern coast. Right. And there's another island past it. Right. I think we should do a field trip there. It's, oh, see oh, some absolutely. of this light nightlife. <laughs> I've actually been to that coast of Spain. Um to a, I, I mean, a little block on the name of this town. Is it your, was a Trichinella your... meeting that was held there. It was it was below Valencia. Mm-hmm. If you hit Bellandrone, it was below Belladrone. Also, it was. Uh, I'm blocking. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Um, Daniel, can you read our last? David email? writes about the 53 year old woman visiting from Bolivia. I believe she has a fasciola fluke infection. Good show. What amazes me, however, is that her eosinophils are getting a reading. From what I have read, the eosinophils simply don't activate due to the fluke's ability to disable the dendritic presentation of the antigens. I would prescribe a round of triclobendazole to help this patient after the ultrasounds. Most radiologists don't know how to diagnose an infection anyway, so I would prescribe the medicine and (laughs) see if she eliminates the flukes. David. 
You know, we only work with top-notch, excellent you radiologists. Betcha. I just, you know, so that no radiologists, because I think we have a large following of radiologists that listen to it. So. We do, actually. And in fact, I, I know of a large tome written by a radiologist for the diagnosis of parasites based really? on radiological findings. Yeah, there's a lot of them. The, the town is Alicante. 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 All right. Yeah, we had a meeting there of Tricanella, so it was a lot of fun. F- food in Spain is wonderful. It's just it's too late at night. <laughs> you know, if you, you at go 10 to o'clock. restaurants well, when everybody else is asleep, you get fantastic service. <laughs> no, but the great thing about Spain, I'm actually heading there in April, is that you don't have to shift your, your clock. So if you eat at mm. what's, let's say, 5 o'clock New York time, it's, it's like, about 10 o'clock it's true, it's in Spain. True, and, you know, I, I once went to a town in Spain, I think it was 9.30, and I was like, oh, we're here for dinner. And they looked at us like we were from another planet, yeah, which yeah. we were. <laughs> 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 Who would possibly eat at 9.30 in the evening? It's way too early. The tapas were fantastic, I can recall. And, and they had a, little bowls of green olives. Everyone was different. You know, it was from a different kind of olive grove, and they were fantastic. And, of course, the wines are unbelievable, too. So. I like Spain. I like Spain. I like Spain a lot. Yeah, I agree. This is 101, episode 101 wow. of TWIP, which you can find on iTunes and microbe.tv slash TWIP, our new home. But we're still at Microbe World, but all of the podcasts are there at microbe.tv. And we love getting your questions and comments. You can send them to twip at microbe.tv as well as your case guesses. And yes, we only had actually one email. But you know what the thing is? Most of them go to the case guesses now. We have shifted the burden. You are. <laughs> but they'll come back. Don't worry. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Dixon de, de Pommier is right here at Columbia, and he's also at trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your case reports, as always, and your insight. And you too, Dixon, your insight. (laughs) That was very nice of you and polite to include me. (laughs) And your insight into the history of parasitology. I'm an old fart. That's true. If you want to put it that way, I will not object. I would would say that (laughs) I've seen a lot of of the early days of parasitology. And we are getting them down on a recorded medium so they will last forever, <laughs> your thoughts. And we have your course, basically, the first 20 episodes. You do. That is true. And I'm very happy for and that. so uh, you will live on long after you Thank are you, Vincent. decomposed in the <laughs> Roman latrines. That's right. Like, what is Beethoven doing at this very moment? He's, He's decomposing. decomposing. <laughs> He's probably all decomposed. Uh, probably. Probably at this point. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.com. WS, the music you hear on TWIP, and I do hope you hear it. I'm sure you hear the beginning, but probably most of you don't hear the end. There's music at the end, too. It is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You have been listening to This Week in Parasitism. We do thank you for joining us. Very much so. And we will be back soon. Another TWIP is is parasitic. parasitic.